Hello, regular dude. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 56. Uh, we are going to be discussing uh, Nancy Drew Mystery Story number six, The Secret at Redgate Farm. Well, aren't you a regular Nancy Drew? I learned that from the Nancy Drew detective. Okay, go. You think you can follow the clues and solve the case of the missing condiment, Nancy Drew? Because I've read every Nancy Drew mystery ever written. Nancy, please tell me you're joking. Wow, you suck at this Nancy Drew stuff. You should get a new hobby. My name is Carson Drew, and this is my assistant, Nancy. Curtains for you, Miss Drew. Nancy. Nancy Drew strikes again. A regular Nancy Drew. I guess we'll start off by saying that uh, the original was released in 1931 and the revised version was released in 1961. About in 1950, though, I found this fun little tidbit. Um, the cover art was updated by Bill Gillies, and that is, um, that's the one that I have. Oh, I don't nice. Know what cover you have, Corey. I also have that one, and I do have the original text as well, but when I bought it, the dust jacket was missing, so I don't actually know what yeah. the cover art for the original looks sure, like sure. but i'm guessing because this is an earlier one that there's probably three different you know cover arts for this i so. think so yeah i think so um but i think that this bill gillies one is the one that like has stood the test of time and most people are familiar with it's nancy standing behind a tree watching the cult members enter the cave um, but this one, I brought this up because this one uh, got a lot of criticism because if you can see the cult members over in the corner, mm -hmm. they're definitely wearing like these like white hooded uh, robes and the, the hoods on them have a bit of a point to them. Yeah. Um, and they look an awful lot like KKK robes. <laughs> I will say the um, the interior illustrations in the original had the same same robes. Let me find that real quick. Very, very interesting. Oh, yeah, you can kind of see in the background there, somebody still has his cap on, but... Ah, uh, yeah, it's pointed. But yeah, they do describe it as pointed hat. So, okay, I've just Googled the uh, original here, and oh, yeah, they are definitely wearing that on the original cover as well. Okay, so it's not a Bill Gillies thing. It's just, that's just the way we've characterized these cult members' outfits. Okay, great, yes. great. Well, and this scene looks like it's the one where Nancy's watching the cult members dance um, mm -hmm. right before they go into the cave. So she's like hiding in the bushes. Very yeah. similar, but in the right. newer art, they're obviously already headed headed into the cave. Not dancing, right. I do like Nancy's outfit a lot better than the original um, artwork. Yeah. This is not. <laughs> That's what I was going to talk about. Honestly, like KKK robes aside, which we should definitely still talk about, but KKK robes aside for a second, mm -hmm. this outfit is not, this. she's not, first of all, she's not wearing blue, which is like WTF, Nancy's signature color is blue. Everybody mm -hmm. knows that. <laughs> she and it's like a this white collar. Plus, she has her blonde hair is so blonde, like yeah. like yellow blonde. But she also has like these dark looking eyebrows, which definitely <gasps> makes it look like her hair is dyed. I didn't even or, like, notice bleached. that. Yeah, and it just it gives her like a very like um nineteen twenties starlet. Oh, kind of yeah, look. I can see it. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Um, and it's just, yeah, it's just not it. It just doesn't look like Nancy Drew to me. To pair the pink, the like hot pink sweater with, yeah, the, with the yellow maroon. hair. Oh, well, the yellow hair and then the maroon skirt. It's just mm -hmm. not a good look with the dicky as well. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's like Nancy Drew would never. She would never. This no. is not a matching outfit. Her this, fashion sense it, is much better than this. Much better. Um, I don't know if this, I mean, this was obviously, um, this cover art was released in 1950. So this must have been like a 1950s-esque outfit. And you can see that um, with the sweater, I think, especially. But like, ew. Yeah. <laughs> ew. Yeah. I don't like it. Um, I don't, I don't either. Okay, but so the KKK robes. 
Yes. Why? Isn't I mean, that what cults wear? Isn't that just what we're supposed to associate? Is that just the thought? Is it just supposed to be that, like, well, this is how people will know it's a cult. We'll put them in KKK robes. A cult so that, full of bad guys, maybe? Hopefully that's I mean, the it is, Yeah, it is a good, a good sign that the cult in this, they are actually the bad guys, right? So, you know, they if they are supposed to be KKK members, they are firmly criminals. So great. Right. Um, but, yeah, it's just an odd an odd choice i mean the white robes in and of themselves is kind of an odd choice like can you just make them black right it's weird i don't know but uh yeah yeah well we'll we'll have to talk about that in the context of the story as well because of course because there's a lot more to that as well so yes (laughs) um but yeah but so overall Corey, aside from the cover what did you what were your just some of your more general thoughts about about this one i thought it was an interesting premise for sure oh yeah um i did like the uh, emphasis that they put on the code breaking that nancy did i did not no i did not no <laughs> but but we could talk about that because i have very specific reasons why but i will say i know last time i um praised Mildred's writing for the original text. I think I liked the revised version a little bit better in this. I think that Harriet actually did a good job of, I mean, overall it's the same story. It's not one of those Mm -hmm. where she changed a whole lot. There are definitely some differences. And I think we'll talk about that at the end of the summary, because to go into what those are, I think I would have to include some spoilers. Um, But the way she condensed it made a lot of sense and cut out some of the stuff that was a little less necessary. Mm Mm-hmm. And she definitely plays up the Nancy code breaking part of it a lot more, um, which felt a little bit more true to like the games where you do have to do a lot of code breaking as Nancy. And I don't feel like we get a lot of that in the original mystery stories where Nancy's working that hard on on code breaking, but you didn't like that very much. I didn't like it because it felt really ridiculous to me. Okay. Like the, the solution to the code, I was like, this is, this cannot be real and like the whole the way that nancy realizes she's solved it it's like you don't know shit like you don't how do you you can't how do you get to that answer and then like just assume that you have it right oh well it might because it has a squiggle over it it must be Mm -hmm. it must stand for this and it's like (laughs) okay and also there was like no point where like i know that we probably weren't really there at this time and um you know, in writing, but like there was no, it was just a description of the code. Like there wasn't a moment where we got the code written out and we were able to see Nancy's thought process like on paper. Okay. Like yeah. if we, if we could have written the code in the book and like shown Nancy's like working on it, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. With like updated things throughout, then that, I think that would have been a lot better. But instead we just get like, you know, she initially sees the code. She doesn't really know what it means. She works on the code. She makes a bit of a breakthrough with it, but then she can't get any further. But, and so we just, so all we really see is we don't see, as the reader, we don't see the breakdown of the code and we don't really get to follow what um, the code says. Or, Mm -hmm. you know, we aren't learning with Nancy. Instead, we're just watching Nancy figure it out. Yeah. Um, And I think like as someone who, you know, reads and loves mystery novels, a lot of the point of mystery novels is to, you know, help your reader along a journey of solving the mystery. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that they get to experience it in the same way that like your detective might. But we don't really get that. We just get to watch nancy do it instead That's of true. experience it. and it, it also just in the end it was just stupid i was like this just doesn't <laughs> it plays in very differently in the original code. but we do get a yeah. lot more of nancy's involvement with the code in the revised text in the original mm-hmm. it's it's way worse of like nancy sat there <laughs> yeah. and looked at the code we don't even get the like little example of like what the uh-huh. first few letters are and now that you say all this i'm wondering what the like narratively what the point of was the code Um, because if you think about it, they could have just said everything over the phone, (laughs) but anyway. Well, the thing is, and this, cause this is my thoughts, but I'm a very, I'm a like very two minds about this book. Part of me really liked it. Okay. Part of me really hated it. Okay. So I'm hugely ambivalent. Um, 
And, and part of it is because I think like as a Nancy Drew book, it did not work. Okay. Um, as a mystery book or like more of like a suspense thriller book, it did work. Um, but Nancy did no sleuthing. <laughs> Truly. Yeah. Nancy did no investigating in this book. The only sleuthing or investigating that she did was trying to crack this code. Um, Definitely. and as I said, I thought that that kind of failed <laughs> as like a, as a device. So, um, it also just like the way some of the interactions that we have and the way that the story is resolved did not feel like a um, typical Nancy Drew uh, resolution, mm -hmm. um, which I want to talk about when we get to that. And I just, yeah. So like, I really enjoyed reading it because I felt like it was super scary honestly. Okay, I yeah. thought it was like one of the spookiest Nancy Drew books I've ever read. Um, not, not spooky, but scary. Okay. Um, I, I, I put a note that it reminded me of a Gothic horror novel, like okay, a Southern Gothic. That. Yeah. Yes. Because of the way, like they're out in the boonies and there's, mm -hmm. there's this creepy cult on a hill and you know, these cult members, it, it, it felt very like children of the corn <laughs> okay <laughs> like signs like all of that stuff felt like it, it was it was spooky in that way yeah um and i yeah and and so like the suspense really kept me going and pulled me through the book but like thinking about it as a nancy drew book i'm like this doesn't this doesn't hit the same way that uh, the other nancy drew books hit for me you know it doesn't make me satisfied yeah to, definitely to to read it like because it doesn't hit the tropes that I'm wanting with a Nancy Drew book you know definitely it felt like well and I know most of the Nancy Drew stories rely on Nancy like it, a lot of coincidences just falling into place but it sure. just felt like it was just everything was overly serendipitous and just like uh -huh. Nancy you never should have found out about this in the first place and now you're like so involved with it by just right it, it doesn't really make sense that you're involved at all. And it, it felt like it was just a lot of like, okay, now we're going to just like go sit on the farm for a week. Right. Okay. Now we're going to run errands for a week. Okay. Now we're going to focus on making fake costumes for two chapters and just like, okay, what are we doing? Come on, let's do something, Nancy. Don't just drive mm -hmm. around. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, definitely. And like, I appreciate it for, you know, like some of that is like, I understand Nancy has a, you know, desire to help people that she would view as being less fortunate or, you know, in some kind of strife that she thinks she can help with. I don't know that going and staying at their house um, is really that much help. <laughs> it's not. Really, it's just the financial factor it's of really it. really just an opportunity for you to take a little vacation, Nancy. Yeah. Um, and so it just felt kind of like, I, I, I feel like Nancy would want to help. I don't know that Nancy would want to stay. Yeah. Maybe for a couple days, but not for like a month or whatever it was that she actually did end up staying. Right. Like, um, you know, definitely give the girl a ride, definitely probably check back in and stuff. But like, it it almost made it seem like Nancy's a marketing expert on yes! hotels and she's going to come save this business that has nothing to do with uh -huh. the actual mystery plot. Uh -huh. She's just going to like do household chores until a clue falls in her lap. And right. instead of like going right. out and investigating what she thinks is, thinks is going on. Mm -hmm. Okay. So th three words. Okay. Uh, cults, obviously. Cults. cults <laughs> Caves. Cults. Um, or cave, I want to say, singular. yeah, cave, cult and cave. Those are very good, very descriptive. I want to say like, well, I guess I, I want to like country, but I also, can I just say Southern Gothic again? Yes, you can. Yes. <laughs> Southern Gothic cult in a cave. <laughs> Perfect. That's exactly what this book is. Okay. So we start off with the weirdest start and that is um or not a weird start i should say a, a common start probably for nancy drew books but um a bad start um because it's racist 
Um, we uh, start off with some racism right toward, right off the bat towards an Asian shop clerk. Um, apparently, they quote unquote mysteriously um, discouraged Bess from buying this blue jade perfume, um, but it, it came to not as Bess was actually able to buy it and did end up buying it. So why I can it shed a little bit more light on the mysterious okay. part of this. This was one of the things that they cut from the original text. So the original okay. text started off, they're out for a shopping trip and then they're mm-hmm. rushing to get to the train. And Bess is like, wait, I really wanted to buy some perfume. Let's stop in this perfume shop. Um, so we actually get the scene where she's trying to buy it, where in the, okay. the revised, it it's not that great of a scene, but it's long. Mm-hmm. So they just cut it yeah. to where we're like, on their way out of the shop, but Beth stops. She really wants this perfume. She says some racist things about wanting to smell like she's from Asia. And it's oh. really strange. Um, but then they're talking to the shop clerk and um, Bess asks about a specific perfume, the Blue Jay perfume. And the shop clerk is like, no, actually somebody has already bought that. And Nancy, Bess and George get like really huffy and insistent. Like I, surely, I mean, you got a lot here. Like surely the other person that has already purchased this wouldn't mind parting with a little bit. Like, why can't you just sell it to us? and they like get really um i don't know just like insistent karenish yes yes very (laughs) karenish thank you i said it's insistent a few times but they they do they essentially just like force this uh lady to sell them the perfume and she's like fine i'll sell you the smallest bottle that i have if you'll just will like stop and get out of here um yeah so they do Okay, that makes a lot more sense because when they were talking about her discouraging them to buy it, I was very confused because I was like, first of all, why would a sales clerk not want you to buy something in the store? Mm-hmm. Um, why is it in the store if it's not right. for sale? Um, and I that was a question that I had throughout the book that yeah. never really got answered, um, which well, I'll have to talk about too. It's like, if you're the cult and this is relevant to your operation somehow why are you selling it why is it in the store don't put it in the store if it's like a special thing um but nancy has to be oh sorry sorry (laughs) yeah nancy has to find a way into the mystery i understand but she just had to be so bratty about it like give us the perfume we want it and the lady's like well it costs this much and nancy's like well you're only saying it costs that much because you don't want to sell it to us so you're driving up the price and she's like no it's just legitimately expensive and i've already sold this to someone else who's coming to get it later and nancy like oh it's it's kind of weird but that is horrible (laughs) that's worse than mm-hmm. what I read. It's like, we're about to miss our train. Just sell it to us so we're not late. I'm like, All oh right. Y'all didn't God. have to come in the perfume store at all, but okay. This is the worst customer service story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, okay. So, yeah. So, but Bess does end up buying this perfume. But, but they, yeah, they have to rush back to get on the train back to River Heights. Um, and so they're kind of hurrying along and because it's July and it's hot and they finally make it to the train station. Um, and then Nancy's just throughout this way, just mulling over this, you know, quote unquote, strange encounter they had with this shopkeeper. And she starts thinking that like, well, the perf- perfume was expensive. So like, even if she like was lying about the, you know, expense to like try to discourage us from buying it, we did buy it. So she should have been happy to you know get that much money out of us or or whatever but so she's like well whatever it's just she's just thinking about it and once they get on the train they're like talking about all the different things they bought that day you know just glorifying in their rich pretty girl lives (laughs) um and nancy notices that there's like a girl sitting across from them on the train who looks like she's really ill um and of course, Bess decides that now this is the perfect time to open up her perfume and give it a try on a crowded, hot train in the middle of July. Um, and of course, right as she opens it, she almost spills the entire bottle directly onto Nancy. Um, so now the whole train smells like perfume. They changed this as well. Oh, really? This Did was George's fault. No, no. Bess um, actually oh! leaves it wrapped up in her shopping bag and they put the <gasps> shopping bags like in the overhead compartment and George goes up to like get a bag out of it and she drops the bag and that shatters it everywhere. Oh my God. Yeah. 
So and this was George's fault. And they changed it uh-huh, to, make to it be Bess's Bess. Fault. Because Bess is clumsy. Oh, I hate it so much. Oh, I want to punch a wall. Oh, <laughs> she just had to be frivolous. So she had to smell her perfume right now. No, it was oh. George. George got too excited about getting off the train early and does, knocked things over. Does Harriet Stratemeyer Adams hate women? Is At that least what this Bess. is? <laughs> like, oh my God. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Well, I'm just saying, like, she must, uh, there must be some reason for this, this, because it feels like self-hatred. You yeah. know what I mean? feels like I'm going to pick all the feminine qualities, and I'm going to make that character just the worst yeah. that everybody likes to bully and pick on. It just is like, come on. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. So George dropped so, it, but only Nancy got the perfume on herself. Bess and George uh, didn't get any on themselves. So that explains why later Nancy is recognized as wearing the perfume. So. Right. So we'll get there. Sorry, uh, I keep interrupting. But No, no, no. It's okay. That's interesting. It definitely colors my opinion of the book. Um, so, yeah. So Nancy is, you know, covered in this perfume. Um, they are able to save some of it, though not all of it spilled out of the bottle. So Bess uh, recovers that. Um, but now Nancy looks back up at the girl that was ill and she sees that she's fainted. Um, you know, maybe because now the train car smells overwhelmingly of perfume. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, but they kind of panic, you know, and they call for a doctor, but there isn't one in the car. So Nancy, like, rubs the girl's wrists, um, which I don't know what that's supposed to do, but it revives her. Uh, Add that okay. to Nancy Skills, rubbing wrists to <laughs> perform <Like> CPR. <laughs> healing touch or something. Like, geez. Oh, yeah, maybe no. it's like, I'm like, is this like an old school, like, first aid thing that we don't know about anymore because we have air conditioning these days and people don't faint as often? Like, <laughs> acupuncture somehow, like, pressure points yeah. to. <laughs> I know that, I know, like, the rubbing on the chest, like, rubbing on the breastbone with the knuckles. It's supposed to help if somebody has, like, passed out. Oh, okay. Kind of, I didn't know it's that. It's kind of painful. Yeah. Oh, um, well, that explains it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that on um, uh, Bondi Rescue. <laughs> okay, nice. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen Bondi Rescue. No? I'm a huge fan of Bondi Rescue. Uh, to everybody listening out there, it's uh, an Australian show uh, with lifeguards on Bondi Beach, on, you know, on Bondi Beach in Australia. Um and I have never seen more attractive men in real life. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and it's not like they're attract. They're like it's not like traditionally attractive. They are attractive because of their skill. They're tan. They're they're in shape, but not like overly in shape. You know what I mean? They're like in shape in a way of like that man could save my life. Oh, okay. And, and they frequently do. Um, and so <laughs> <laughs> very nice. So I love watching that show. Anyway, that's where I learned that you should, uh, if somebody's passed out, rub on their breastbone with your knuckles. Um, Good to know. But never the wrists. I've never seen the wrist one. So I don't know where that came from. Um, But they do go get her some water because apparently there is water, a water cooler on this train. Was that common for every train car to have like a water cooler? Uh, Not that I know of, but why not? I guess. (laughs) Again, I don't know. This it's just we it's just a weird first chapter. Lots of weird details. Anyway, so they go get her some water and as Nancy is like filling up the cup in the water cooler, a man approaches her, grips her arm and asks, "Any word from the chief?" Um and Nancy is like, "What? Uh what are you talking about?" Uh and she, you know, she's never seen this man before, but she does make a point of like saying that he has a cruel face. And steel gray eyes. Um, that's so that we as the reader know that he's not a good guy. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, after, you know, he notices her confusion, the man realizes he made a mistake and apologizes, but says, but that perfume, well, never mind. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, you know, Nancy's, of course, confused by that. You know, who did he think she was? Who is the chief character he's talking about? And, you know, why did Bess's perfume make him think that she was someone he knew? It's weird, but she's got to take the water back to this fainted girl. So she goes back. The girl is awake now. She's grateful for the help. And George makes a joke that it was Bess's perfume that caused it, which is my initial thought as well. Um, But the girl says, no, no, no. I just haven't felt well all day. So 
They eventually make it to the River Heights stop, and it turns out that this girl's getting off there too. Um, so they get off the train, and she asks Nancy for directions to the center of town, but Nancy's still kind of concerned about her because of, you know, her being ill. She doesn't want her walking so far after she's just, you know, passed out. Um, and so she invites her home <laughs> for a snack because you're Nancy Drew and that's what you do. Yes. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you don't just offer to give her a ride. You're like, no, 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 I'm going to feed you. Um, <laughs> you live with me now. Come along. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, the girl, you know, tries to like be like, oh, no, 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 I'm fine or whatever. But of course, Nancy doesn't take no for an answer. Um, we learn that the girl's name is Joanne Bird. Um, She lives with her grandmother at Redgate Farm, which is about 10 miles from Round Valley, which I guess is somewhere nearby. I don't know. We never learned that either. Um, (laughs) We need a map. (laughs) We do need a map in this in this book. Um, She tells us that she left home today to try to try to find work in River Heights because they're having problems paying the mortgage on their beautiful and beloved farm because of like some bad real estate investment advice that her grandmother received. So they eventually get to the Drew home where Hannah serves them soup and sandwiches. And of course, Joanne is feeling much better after this. And but she tells Nancy, you know, thank you so much. But I really need to be going now because I have a job interview. Um, She asks Nancy where to find the address of where she needs to go for this interview um, and shows her like the advertisement for it. But Nancy realizes that the ad isn't for River Heights. It's for Riverside Heights, which is actually a few miles away. Okay. All right. (laughs) So now we know there's a River Heights and a Riverside Heights um, very, very close to each other in this universe. Sounds like next to each other. Because this is insanity. What? This has got to be a nightmare. Can you imagine the confusion that this would (laughs) this would give like? Everyone. People addressing mail, like, mm-hmm. oh my god. Also, it's very like it seems very alternate universey to me. Like, it seems like in like a if this were like what's the show Twin Peaks? If this were like Twin Peaks, <laughs> River Heights is like the nice town where it's like Pleasant View and everybody's all happy and everything's perfect and fine. And then Riverside Heights is like the inverse. It's like the upside down or something. It's like where everything bad happens and then the evil people live. Oh, oh, we're not from River Heights. We're from Riverside Heights. (laughs) Nancy even makes a joke about it in the book. Like, uh, yeah, I don't know what the developers were thinking. Like, I don't know what the author was thinking here. Come on seriously um anyway so nancy is now of course realizing that this mistake she's like oh don't worry i'll drive you you know we'll get you there in time you know um and they also drop off bess and george on their way to this job interview so they make it there nancy is unimpressed by this side of town but she doesn't say anything about to the girl (laughs) She's just quietly snobbish. Yeah. Um, also, weirdly at this point, this girl is so nervous, I guess, but she asks Nancy to come, like, into the job interview with her, like, come upstairs to, like, the office where the job interview is because she's nervous. You just met! <laughs> I wouldn't go into a job interview with someone I knew, no. like, for a long time. I would never. <laughs> so weird um nancy though is of course like of course wait what uh i don't think harriet did the revision oh i have it in my notes here that it's someone named lynn eeler we'll look that up yeah i see that under the wicked the carolyn Keene wikipedia can't really see anything else that she's done aside from that and it looks That's like really that interesting. was the only revision that she did. Yeah. Okay, well, maybe Lynn, Lynn Eeler hates women. <laughs> Sorry, Harriet. Um, <laughs> anyway, okay, oh, where well, was I? I just assumed um, there. Sorry. Yeah. I should have looked too. that up before we started. And... and when I assume, I make an ass out of me. Um, <laughs> okay. 
Um, so yeah, so she like asked Nancy to come upstairs with her to this job interview. Um, and Nancy's like, yeah, sure, of course. Um, and so they head up to this third floor and they get to this, you know, seedy kind of looking office and this rude guy greets them and they start to explain why they're there for the job interview and he directs Joanne into like this side office and tells her to wait there and then while she's in there he offers Nancy the job like he tells Joanne to go into this separate room and then offers Nancy the job because he wants a quote-unquote good-looking girl yeah do we think that it's actually because of her looks or it's because Nancy's wearing the perfume do you think it that he subconsciously noticed, oh, the perfume? Well, maybe subconsciously, but it can't be consciously, because if it was consciously, then he would realize that she's not actually part of the cult. Right. Because this is also a weird, this is also a weird thing. Yeah, why didn't he say something about the perfume? Like, why wasn't he suspicious that she was wearing it? The perfume makes no sense. No, it makes it no sense as an identifier, and we'll have to talk about that, because it makes even less sense later. Yes. Um, so yeah, so I don't know, I don't know, um, because it doesn't make sense as to why the man on the train mistook her for someone in the cult, because later there, it's very obvious that she's not a member of the cult, because they say so, so it's like, then the perfume doesn't matter. Then right. what? Anyway. Um, so, so um, he offers her the job, and Nancy is, of course, like, super annoyed with this, like, as any of us would be, like, hey, my friend is here to interview for this, you asshole um but she declines um but then he gets like a telephone call um so he goes to answer that and she listens in and she also calls this phone call unbusinesslike um which doesn't really tell us a whole lot about what's going on like we don't know what about it is unbusinesslike but i guess he's just not being professional somehow on the phone yeah. <laughs> um and we also determine through this somehow conversation somehow that his name is al um, while he's on the phone, he continues to like kind of mean mug Nancy from where he is. Um, and he's like talking to the other person on the line and he says, okay, Hank, you say you found a girl. Fine. Can't be too careful in this business. Which is just weird. Yeah. <laughs> this book is so weird. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, he hangs up um, and Nancy's kind of like, what were you doing? And he was like, oh, I'm taking stock quotations. Nancy's like, oh, is that what this business is? Is this an investment house? And he says, no, we run a manufacturing business. So Nancy's like, okay, so what do you manufacture? And But he just, like, pretends not to hear her. <laughs> so he just goes into the office to interview Joanne. So this is weird. This is a seedy, clearly a seedy operation. Shady. Nancy can't figure out what it is that they actually do here. Um, that's what we're supposed to understand from this whole um, experience. But when he goes into the office to interview Joanne, Nancy notices that he left the slip of paper that he was taking notes on on that telephone call out, like, on this table. So Nancy, of course, decides to take a little peeky peek at what he was writing down. And she sees a string of numbers with, like, weird markings over the top of some of them. Odd. Definitely not stock quotations, though, like right. he was saying. So Nancy, of course, just immediately is like, it's a code. Um, and so she starts to write it down, copy it down on another piece of paper. She's like kind of rushing and hurrying so that she can do this before, you know, they come out of Joanne's interview. Um, unfortunately, she can only get like the first row of numbers copied and uh, back into her chair to not arouse suspicion before they come back out of the office. But even though she's like made it out and she's back in her seat, the man, like, realizes that he left this slip of paper um, and, like, rushes over to the telephone to pick it up. And he, like, glares at Nancy like she he knows that she looked at it somehow. <laughs> Dude. Suspicious. Dude. <laughs> Stop being so weird. <laughs> but, yeah, so he says, like, uh, he kicks him out really quickly and is like, sorry, you know, position's been filled, basically. Um, and tells them, you know, don't come back. Um, and Joanne is really upset by this. She's close to tears, of course, because, you know, getting a job was really important to her to help her with, uh, to help her grandmother with her farm. Um, and Nancy tries to reassure her by telling her, like, don't worry, that was clearly a terrible job. You didn't want that job. 
uh, don't worry. Just like a nice thing for the rich girl to say. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, don't worry. You wouldn't want that job. It's like, yeah, you don't, you've never worked a day in your life, Nancy. You don't know, you don't know who wants a job. I know that she's just trying to be reassuring. Of course. Um, but it is, it is just such a shitty thing for someone rich to come down on someone who is experiencing money problems and be like, don't worry, everything's going to be fine. You'll be okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Want to give me some of your money, Nancy? Right. Um, anyway. So, also, Nancy does tell her about, like, you know, what she saw or whatever and tells Joanne about the numbers that she found and that she thinks it's a code, but she's like, but don't tell anybody because it could be, like, you know, criminal activity or whatever. Got to keep it on the down low. And Joanne's like, okay, sure. But she's still discouraged, of course, and she doesn't want to go home without having, you know, secured a job. Nancy invites her to stay at her house, which, okay, props to you, Nancy, for that, I guess. But Joanne's like, no, 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 I've already, like, you know, trespass too much on your goodwill. I'll find a boarding house in town so that I can job hunt here again tomorrow. Um, and so Nancy helps her find a place and, and takes her there and then heads home. Um, on the way home, she stops by the Fane residence um, and talks to Bess and George about, you know, everything that happened that day. Um, and as they are like standing in the yard and like talking about this, Nancy sees a quote unquote foreign car drive past and notices that the driver is the cruel looking man from the train um that stopped her over by the water cooler um he like slows down the car uh, and like gives them like a look when he passes and like gives this creepy self-satisfied smile Ugh. Nope. Ugh. <laughs> no 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 um but nancy of course memorizes his license plate because Good thinking, She's Nancy. A bad bitch. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, so she goes home and she talks to Carson also about everything that's happened. Um, he gives her a book on codes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but otherwise, he's not that much of help um, because he's tied up in a case right now. Um, but Nancy reads the book that night and starts working on like the list of numbers. Uh, takes two hours, um, but she cracks it. Two hours, I guess, is supposed to be a long time. Doesn't seem like that long to crack a code, but okay. <laughs> um, Guys, the code is go, one is A, two yep. is B. Yeah, that's... yep. It's a it's a um, simple substitution code. It's a shift a shift cipher, right? Nancy's a genius because she solved that all by herself in two hours. Oh my god! Yeah. Two hours. Yeah. <sighs> okay, so um, so after she works out the code, she realizes that it spells out the words calling meeting. Um, but, of course, we don't know who this meeting is called by, where the meeting is, what it's for, when it is, anything like that. Um, but it's late, so she goes to bed. The next day, she starts to work a little bit more on the code because it is the su simple substitution cipher, but there are also those like weird symbols over some of the numbers, so she can't really figure out what that's about uh, works on that a little bit and doesn't really make a lot of progress so in the afternoon she decides to take Bess and George with her over to go visit Joanne to see if she's made any progress on her job search um, they find her at the boarding house where she's renting a room and she is very very dejected it's obvious that she has not had any luck today um, but she she's keeping at it so they uh, decide that they want to cheer her up and they're they're like what if we all go for a drive in the country um, let's see is that really all that they do? Okay. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I was like, this isn't when they go to Redgate Farm yet. Okay, sorry. No, they just talk about going to Redgate Farm. Gotcha. Um, they remark on what a beautiful day it is and how uh, they would love to visit Joanne at Redgate Farm someday. Um, I want to say in the original text, they talk about how they've like just gotten back from Shadow Ranch. Because Shadow Ranch is the oh. book right before this, where we meet Bess and George for the first time and... Nancy like makes a remark like, oh, they love that trip so much. Surely we would all love to go spend the summer on a farm together because that's just what we do as young 18-year-old girls with lots of money. We're able to spend our summers however we want to. <sighs> the thought of them joining her at Redgate Farm cheers Joanne up quite a bit. So they um, 
you know, they take her back home. And then Nancy is, she's heading back home, but she needs some gas on the way home. So they stop at a gas station. And while she's filling up the car, they see the same perfume clerk who had um, sold Bess the perfume. Uh, They see her going into the same office building where Joanne had been yesterday interviewing for that job. Um, So, of course, they follow her. Obviously, we got to figure out where she's going. Um, They drive over and Nancy tells Bess and George to wait in the car while she goes into the building. Oh, she says, wait in the car. But, you know, if if something happens, if I'm not back in a few minutes, come after me. Um, She ends up meeting a handyman in the corridor. Quarter? Quarter? Quarter. Hallway. (laughs) Sorry. She meets a handyman in the hallway of the building and she asks about the woman and this guy is like not super interested in giving Nancy a lot of information. He's like, how should I know? I just work here. Uh, But he explains that um, she must be working with the man um, that we'd met yesterday, the guy with the loud voice, Al. Um, But he did, he does tell us that he overheard the woman saying that her name is Yvonne Wong. Very interesting. Um, This is some good information to go off of, though. So Nancy heads back to the car and tells Bess and George about it. So on the way home, they're talking about Yvonne a little bit and wondering why she would change jobs so quickly. If she was just working at the perfume store yesterday, why is she changing all of a sudden? Um, But from that phone call that she overheard that nancy overheard al on yesterday um the shady guy in the building like you know maybe there's some specific reason why she's coming to work for them but it all just seems very weird um we go on the next day the next day is very rainy so nancy just stays inside all day working on the code but we don't make a lot of progress um so then the following day she gets a call from joanne and joanne tells her that she hasn't been able to find any work yet so she is planning on getting back to redgate farm um actually we learned that her grandmother called her and told her that someone has offered to buy the farm and Joanne um well the guy that uh, offered to buy the farm really lowballed the grandma and is like I'm giving you this offer and it's the best offer you're ever going to get because nobody would ever want your land and I'll give you till like Tuesday but then my offer's gone and Joanne's really not in favor of selling the farm but her grandmother needs the money um so she thinks that she needs to like get back home so that she can talk her grandmother out of selling the farm Um, but she's realized she doesn't have enough money to both pay for her room that she's staying in here and get uh, a train ticket home. So Nancy's like, oh, problem solved. I'll just drive you home. Pack your bags. Be ready at 10 a.m. tomorrow. I'll come pick you up. We'll all go. Uh, We'll get Bess and George as well. So that evening, Nancy goes home and Carson asks her, hey, I'm actually going out of town for a work trip this week. Could you like talk to Bess and George, like find a friend to stay with. And she's like, well, I'll do you one better. What if I go to this farm for the week while you're on your work trip and it'll all be good. And he's like, wow, that's even better. Of course you can. Um, And Nancy calls Bess and George. They confirm that they can go. So the next day they're off, they go pick up Joanne um, and they head on their way to Redgate farm. Oh yeah. Okay. So when Nancy goes to pick up Bess and George, George tells her that, Hey, someone called for Miss Fane and told me when I got on the phone, they said, tell that Snoopy friend of yours to stop her snooping or she'll be sorry. Uh, but we don't know who <sighs> made this phone call because the guy wouldn't say his name. Um, and they don't want to spook Joanne. So they all kind of discuss this and they're like, let's leave her out of this. Let's not bring this up to her because it's only going to upset her. Uh, But otherwise, they have a good drive up to Redgate Farm. Um, Joanne tells them about their property a little bit. They, um, I guess it used to be, this might not have been in the revised, but I guess maybe it was. At least in the original, original, they say that it was um, two pieces of land and the grandmother Mm -hmm. bought both of them. And then she is um, on the other piece of land that's, well, now they're both the grandmothers, but on the other piece of land, there's like a cave on the property. Um, and I guess that's why they're in money trouble because she couldn't afford to buy the second plot of land and has now mortgaged the farm off of the first oh. plot of land. And so that's why they're having the financial issues is because she okay. couldn't, she thought she'd be able to afford the payments and now she's had to like leverage the I see the farm itself. Yeah, it's a whole thing. But um, Joanne does tell us though, that there is a cave on the property that she's never really had time to explore because she's been too busy helping with the farm. Um, but she said that it's kind of a spooky little area and, and, and it's fun to explore if they want to go there while they're on their trip. Um, and then they decide that they are hungry. So they're going to stop for ice cream at a diner on the way. <laughs> While they're waiting for their Sundays, Nancy realizes that the car is low on gas and the waitress is taking a really long time to get their Sundays out. So Nancy's like, well, you guys wait here, start eating if they come with the food, but I'm just going to go next door, 
put gas in the car and I'll be right back. So she's she goes over to the gas station and the gas attendant like starts to fill up her car but then this other car pulls up with a bunch of people in it um there's a bunch of men in there and then one woman in the car with them and the guy driving is like super rude to the attendant is like fill me up now and make it snappy and he's like oh sorry ma'am do you do you mind waiting and nancy's like no go ahead help them first and uh one of the guys gets out of the car and is like i'm gonna go buy some sodas inside so he goes inside and nancy realizes that that is the guy who had come up on the come up to her on the train and asked her what news she had from the chief um and then nancy realizes that the woman in the car is wearing blue jade perfume so another Mm. very strange coincidence here Um, And then they go to pay the attendant guy and they pull out this like massive roll of cash and are very intentional about being flashy with it. And like, look how much money we have. And they're even kind of weird to the attendant guy. Like, don't you wish you had a roll of cash this big? You'll never have a roll of cash this big. And it's just like very Mm -hmm. strange. And the attendant guy's like, oh, yeah, that is a lot of money. I would love to have that much money. Do you want to pay me? Or like, are you going to pay for the gas? And he Uh like peel he says the book says specifically that he peels off a 20 from the roll and like gives it to the guy the guy has to like go make change out of it he just like makes a very big show of having all this money um and then the guy comes back and puts gas in the car and nancy goes back to the restaurant uh, but while it, the attendant guy is talking to the guys in the car, we learn two of the men's names, Hank and Maurice. Um, and didn't we, when when Al was on the phone during Joanne's job interview, we heard mm-hmm. him refer to a guy named Hank. So Nancy, as the uh, as the other car full of rude people, drives away. She memorizes their license plate. Um, and then before she goes to sit back down with the Sundays, though, she calls Chief McGinnis um, and lets him know what's just happened. Um, I will say as well, Chief McGinnis is not in the original because he had not been invented yet. It certainly seemed like he wasn't really around in the revised either. He didn't he didn't do a whole lot. (laughs) Kind of for for the end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But okay, so she pays for her gas. She goes back into the diner and she tells her friends what she just saw. And Joanne is now super concerned and worried about making it to Redgate Farm in time to beat the uh, the guy who's trying to buy it from the grandmother. Apparently he was supposed to come by at a certain time and it's taking them a long time of course now because the Sundays took so long to come out and everything but Nancy starts to wonder like what if one of those guys that we just saw is the one that's like trying to make the offer on this farm um Mm -hmm. so they're like all right we gotta go then especially if we're trying to beat those guys in that car so they pay and they start driving again but the weather is getting really kind of weird in the distance we can see a big huge storm rolling in and of course now we're about to turn off the main road to take our way to redgate farm and it's a dirt road so uh, we have to really speed through this this little section of road here because it's, of course, going to get really muddy and treacherous if they try to drive on it here um, within, like, supposedly the next few minutes. It's about to start raining. Um, and, of course, it does. It starts storming before they end up getting there, and they're forced to take a detour through the woods. Uh, but the woods are also, like, really scary and treacherous because they're really thick woods, and um, Nancy's just afraid because there's lightning going off, and I think that they even see, like, lightning hit a tree, and she's like, oh my gosh, what if one of these trees falls, like, gets hit by lightning and then falls mm-hmm. and then it hits the car, and then what are we going to do? And, of course, they're, like, out in the middle of nowhere with no one knowing where they are or expecting them as- at a certain time, so um, very harrowing trip. Mm -hmm. Um, but they finally make it out of the woods nancy decides to just like risk it and gun it um but they do get out of the woods but then they get stuck in the mud um (laughs) so (laughs) this is actually kind of um not ingenious but like uh resourceful resourceful yes they're very resourceful here because they're able to use some burlap as like a um what are they called? Like the tread things where you're like, you drive to up get on traction them. to get traction. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so they get burlap out of the trunk of the car and they lay that on the ground and they have two of them pushing and Nancy's like trying to hit the gas and they get it out. Uh, but the storm is so bad that now they can't drive very quickly because Nancy like can't see two foot in front of the car. So they have to drive very, very slowly. And now Joanne's like really eye in the time, like gosh, with the slowdowns here and all the issues, we're definitely not going to make it in time. Um, and George is sitting in the passenger seat next to Nancy and all of a sudden she's like, wait, stop, don't hit that woman. And Nancy's Mm -hmm. like, what are you talking about? What woman? And she's like, I just saw a woman run out in like in front of the car in the middle of the road. And Nancy's like, oh my gosh, I didn't even see a woman. What if she's under the car? Did I hit her? (laughs) And not notice? 
I think you would feel it if you'd hit someone. <laughs> you sure? I would hope so. And Nancy, like, gets out and, like, crawls on her hands and knees and checks under the car just to make sure that there's no one under there. Well, there's not. Um, but then they look and they see a field off to the side of them and they see a, a woman, like, running through the this field away from them. very, like, Wilkie Collins, like... Yeah. Um, like, turn of the century, Charles Dickens, like spooky mr novel yeah <laughs> this um i'm glad that i watched the 1995 uh show so recently yeah. because there was an episode that started just like this where they're driving along and then all of a sudden they're like who is that and then a woman <laughs> just like comes out of nowhere um and it ends up being like a, that episode ends up being more of a ghost story than this but i was like oh my gosh is this story gonna go in that direction what's going on Ooh. it doesn't but it was just kind of a yeah a funny start you know nice yeah, so they see the woman, uh, like, run off into the field away from their car, and Joanne says that, hey, it looks like she's running off in the direction of that cave I was telling y'all about. Um, and she says, maybe she's one of those strange people over there. And Nancy's like, what do you, what do you mean, strange people over there? What are you talking about? Um, but then Joanne's like, wait, oh my gosh, there it is. There's Redgate Farm. Um, and as we like drive along a little bit further the storm clears and we see this beautiful green idyllic farm down below us i guess we're kind of in a, a hilly area um and so yeah. they drive down and they get there um hopefully just in time before the prospective buyer arrives yeah so we get out of the car we meet joanne's grandmother we call her mrs bird um she tells us that um actually the seller just called and because of the storm decided that they're going to come tomorrow instead so we can all breathe a big sigh of relief. You know, we beat them here and, you know, we all sit down to dinner. Oh, and Nancy, um, because, you know, Joanne had mentioned that um, her grandmother had opened up Redgate Farm to boarders to try to, like, help with their money problems. Nancy just kind of immediately asks, hey, can Best George and I be boarders here um, and stay here at Redgate Farm and, you know, pay you for that or whatever and but mrs bird is like no 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 i can't accept your money your guests of joanne or whatever and nancy's like you know well i you know i'm sorry to hear that we'll have to leave tomorrow if we can't you know sign on to be boarders with you or whatever yeah and so she eventually agrees and so they agree to stay and then joanne convinces her grandmother to like call up the seller tell him that she doesn't want to sell um and mrs bird apparently was just like waiting for someone to tell her not to sell the farm um because she didn't want to sell it so she does okay. call the seller and is like i'm not selling it to you but like what the hell like if she didn't want to sell it then i know that she was feeling stressed because of the money problems or whatever and that this would have solved the money problems but it's just like do you have no willpower of your own like you're supposed to be like the owner of this property like you know right. what i mean it just yeah. seems kind of like annoying but whatever um so she calls up the seller and is like no i'm not selling to you but then the man on the line is like clearly really angry with this and tells her that you know she's going to regret this decision basically it's kind of um creepy um but yay, we're not selling Redgate Farm anymore. Crisis averted. <laughs> um, Joanne also decides to go check the mail, and they find answers to their advertisement for a border. So they'll have even more people staying at Redgate Farm soon. So things are looking kind of up, right? We're not selling. We're going to get some more cash from borders. Everything's going to be okay. So everyone kind of excitedly goes to bed. Bess and George are sharing a room, and Nancy and Joanne are sharing Joanne's room. And the next morning, Nancy decides to go ahead and call Chief McGinnis um, to get the information about the cars that she had asked him for because she had called and asked him to look up the license plates for those cars that she had seen. Um, and he says that both cars she saw were rental cars, um, rented and returned already by a man named Philip Smith from Dallas, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy, okay, after hanging up, Nancy immediately comes to the conclusion that that was a phony name because none of the men in the car sounded like they were from Texas. Okay. Um, sure. <laughs> sure, Nancy. Um, uh, I guess this is just like, you know, Northeast people thinking that everybody in the South has a Southern accent. Do we not? 
<laughs> Maybe we do. I don't know. No, I'm I don't kidding. think my access, accent is that Southern. I mean, I can make it Southern, but that doesn't, it's not always Southern. Right, you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, so um, that morning at breakfast, they take a tour of the farm, or after breakfast, they take a tour of the farm. Turkey chases Bess. <laughs> they have a grand old time. Um, they also meet uh, this farmhand who's named Reuben. So he's a shy 40-something-year-old man. And then George makes a comment that Bess is going to break his heart. I made a note about this as well. How gross eh. is that? Bleh. Ugh. Bleh. He's 40. You're 18. What? Bess is going to break his heart by saying you're too old for me? Like, uh, ugh. <laughs> Nope. I mean, like, okay, I know that creepy men will creep on young women, but for George to make that comment about, like, Bess is, like, George. What the hell? Mm. Ew. And not just a, don't like oh, it. Bess, that guy is checking you out. Uh, Bess, yeah. you're going to break his heart. This is going to be your fault. Ugh. And also, like, that you're going to, like, entertain a romance between this right. man. Ugh. No! Sick, 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 sick. Not necessary to be included. No, thank nope. you. Um, also, Nancy is uh, asked to see the cave, of course. She wants to, to go out and explore the cave, just like immediately. <laughs> Wouldn't um, you? I would. Let's uh, go, yeah, Nancy. 100%. It's the whole reason I'd be there. And Joanne tells us it's on this part of the property that her grand is currently renting out to a nature cult named the Black Snake Colony. Hold the phone. You're telling me we had this whole drive up here and you never mentioned that, by the way, a cult was renting out your grandmother's property? And living in a cave. Girl, you really, uh, what do you call it there? Um, the lead. You dropped, buried the lead. Oh, you, you buried, buried the, lead the lead there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> buried the lead. Um, so they talk about that and, you know, Joanne says that she isn't really sure what the cult does. Um, except that she has seen them dance around in white robes and masks under the full moon. <laughs> she says that they've never even really spoken to them. You know, they, you know, send us their rent in the mail. And so she kind of thinks that it's probably they're, you know, like secluded on purpose and they don't really want to like interact with people outside of their cult. Right. Um, and then they just spend the rest of the day getting the house ready for the borders that are going to be coming. And I'm like, oh my God, you're telling me there's a cult next door and Nancy isn't like immediately in those woods. <laughs> like, oh, wow. Um, but anyway, that evening, they're kind of hanging out on the porch before bed when Bess is reading the newspaper and notices an article that mentions the perfume uh, clerk, Yvonne Wong. Hmm. Mm, interesting. Apparently, Miss Wong was employed by a group called the Hale Syndicate, which was illegally importing Asian goods. <laughs> Seems the newspaper says that the syndicate was, like, dissolved by court order, which I don't know how that works. They weren't prosecuted for importing illegal goods. Their group was just dissolved. Very strange. It is strange. Um, but the men who were in charge of the Hale Syndicate have fled. Um, and Yvonne has not been charged because they can't, like, prove that she knew about the illegal activities. Bess and George, though, are, like, very convinced of Yvonne's guilt um, in a way that I have to admit feels a bit racist to me. Yep. So that's fun. Um, <laughs> Nancy. And then Nancy just kind of, like, doesn't think about it and instead is, like, thinking about the code. She's, like, being like, yeah, 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 interesting, whatever, but this code I can't <laughs> figure out. Um, she thinks that because the office that they went to for Joanne's interview was office number 305 and the third code or the third number in the code was a number five, which stood for the letter H, that the H might stand for hail. Okay. Did everybody follow that? Cause no. I didn't. <laughs> It's dumb. That's like saying, that's like saying, oh, I know something good will happen to me tomorrow because tomorrow is the 18th and, and, um, you know, nine plus nine is 18. And I had nine seeds on my muffin this morning for breakfast <laughs> and nine times two is 18. So. And one plus what? eight <laughs> equals nine, which is 18. <laughs> right. Right. 
Oh my god. Yeah. Um, so she she makes that, you know, crack in the code. All right. Whatever. We don't actually know anything. This is my <laughs> point. Is like you make these like really weird tenuous grasps at what you think the code means, but we also don't have any confirmation that yes, that's what the code means. Just because you saw an article in the newspaper that mentioned the Hale Syndicate, which happens to start with the letter H and the, the number of the office is 305 and the third code is third letter in the code is a number five, which must stand for H, so it must mean the Hale Syndicate. What? Um yeah. yeah. Anyway, so she she calls Chief McGinnis um, on the phone, and he's like, "Oh yeah, Nancy, great work. That sounds like a clue. Send the code over so we can look at it." So I guess she's planning to do that or whatever. But she's reviewing the code again, um, and then sees that the sixteen stands for an M. So she's like, "Maybe the man is Maurice. Maybe the M stands for Maurice." And. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then maybe because he was in the car that we saw and his last name is Hale because it's an H. So M and H, Maurice Hale. So she just assumes that the people in the car are also from the Hale syndicate. And that because she knew his, his name is Maurice and that starts with an M. And because there is an M in the code, she assumes that that must be Maurice Hale. The annoying part about it is that she's not wrong. Um, (laughs) but it's just really ridiculous. Um, yeah, Bess, <laughs> Bess remarks that, you know, yeah, solving this code will help you sleep better, won't it, Nancy? And this then it is does. insane. This is insanity. Yeah. You're like, ah, oh, yes, I figured it out. M and H must be Maurice, must mean hail. I mean. <sighs> okay, Master breath, detective. Deep breath. Deep breath. Super <laughs> sleuth. <laughs> Um, the next day, the boarders arrive. Um, there's this cantankerous and crotchety old lady named Mrs. Salisbury, who is dropped off by her daughter to, I guess, enjoy the country. Um, and Carl Abbott, a somewhat rough but affable and spry 63-year-old man who has a large appetite, um, also weirdly dropped off by his son. Was it a trend at this time to, like, drop off your aging relatives in the country? Like taking a dog so. to a farm? I, yeah. No, I think oh it was. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, they're here. Um, yeah. Anyway, so they're, they're staying here now. Um, and they just kind of all, I guess, spend time here at the farm. It's unclear how much, like, time passes between now and later. But, like, it's at least several days. But it could be, like, weeks that we're like all here together it certainly seems like weeks because we all seem to get very close and like familiar with each other which Mm -hmm. is very weird (laughs) um um, and then like one day nancy like goes and gets the mail from mrs bird and sees a letter addressed to the black snake colony um so nancy wants to go like hand deliver it to the cult so that she can like you know check out their operation and everything um but mrs bird is like no i'm going to give it to a neighbor to remail it to them in town bummer yeah. um best milks a cow it's really like just weird weird times at the farm <laughs> doing chores just doing farm <laughs> stuff that's just all just doing chores um but that night it is the full moon um and so you know we remember what joanne said about the cult coming out to dance on full moons so um the girls all kind of like start towards the hill to see if the cult's going to come out tonight and do their dancing and of course they do nancy observes that they're just kind of like flapping around in sheets (laughs) um and when they're done they just like head off in the direction of the cave that joanne mentioned So Nancy is like, oh, that's interesting. They're going to the cave. And she, you know, determines to investigate it later. And they're, like, heading back to the house. And then while they're heading back to the house, they, like, hear a car on the road roar to life and then drive away. Which is, I guess, weird because there's not a whole lot of cars there often. But it just does seem kind of inconsequential. Like, okay. Nancy talks about it though like she's just been horribly threatened and like right. I have to right. find out who it was that drove away I gotta say the way that I'm like we're describing this summary does seem very weird and like boring but the book does not make it boring it's not boring at all 
it's very I felt very like what is yeah what is the car what are they doing you know like figure it out Nancy um so you know it it is it's interesting it's interesting it's intriguing yeah um later uh that morning nancy mentions or the next morning nancy mentions visiting the cave to mrs bird and mrs salisbury you know saying like yeah i want to go check it out or whatever but they like discourage her from doing that telling her that it's going to be dangerous or whatever but regardless nancy heads off that afternoon on a hike um she follows a path along the river and then she hears a shout like ahead of her but she like pauses and she doesn't hear anything else. So she continues on. Um, but very soon she comes across a collapsed woman on the path. Um, the woman says that she tripped over a tree root and broke her ankle. Nancy, of course, immediately offers her help. Um, she wants to go back to the farm to like get someone to come help, you know, like get her somewhere or get her medical attention or whatever. But the woman won't let her. Um, But she does reluctantly allow Nancy to, like, help her get up and help her walk towards what she claims to be her home a little ways up the river. But Nancy is, like, thinks to herself, like, oh, a little ways up the river, that's where the Black Snake colony is, right? (laughs) And so she's like, oh, are you part of that nature cult? And she's like, yeah, I am. No big deal. Nancy very specifically calls it a cult to that woman's face she doesn't say like group or colony which is the name of it right and the woman's just like yeah it's a cult yeah i'm in that cult we're i'm in the cult now Corey, is it just (laughs) me or do people in in cults not typically like it pointed out to them that they are in fact in a cult no they're just an alternative community (laughs) right so what is (laughs) anyway it's weird and it's an awkward moment nancy like looks her over and she's like well you know thinks in her head she doesn't seem very odd she's like dressed normally and she's like wearing this gingham dress and is acting normally so nancy's like "Hmm, i don't know she's actually in a cult (laughs) um so it's weird it's an awkward moment nancy like tries to make a comment to like smooth things over by saying like oh it must be helpful to live an outdoor life um i should like to visit the colony sometime right just like showing her that she doesn't like disapprove right which i which i thought was a smart move on nancy's oh, yeah. part right yeah. and at this at nancy saying that she'd like to visit sometime the woman like box and like warns nancy to like you can't ever come here it's not safe for her which is a little disturbing um And so they just get near, um, like, to the edge of the tree line or whatever, and the woman won't let Nancy help her any further along the path. Um, Nancy's like, all right, but she gets her a branch to, like, act as a crutch, and the woman does seem sincerely thankful for Nancy's help um, and seems to, like, like Nancy because, you know, Nancy went out of her way to help her. Um, She does say, like, she does start to say, like, I wish... But she doesn't finish the thought and instead, you know, again, warns Nancy to stay away from the hillside where the colony is. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately um, for the woman, she couldn't have known that telling Nancy to stay away would only entice her to investigate further. uh, Because now Nancy is sure that there is something fishy happening here and wants to come back later. (laughs) So she goes back to the farmhouse. She gets a call from Chief McGinnis and they couldn't figure out the code. Um, or where the missing men from the Hale Syndicate are. So he tasks her with finding out where the Hale Syndicate men have gone after they vacated Office 305, which did actually end up being their office. So Nancy wasn't wrong. Um, the Hale Syndicate and that office were connected, right? And now she has an assignment from Chief McGinnis. And now McGinnis. she has an assignment from Chief McGinnis. Yes, Who course, has she a does. police force at his disposal. He has to call Nancy and tell her that she needs to get working on this. I mean, I know that this is, like, a trope of, like, detectives is, like, when the police can't figure it out, they call, you know, the, you know, the scrappy the real expert. <laughs> detective, right, who can go yeah. places they can't or whatever. But in all of the iterations of Nancy Drew that I've seen, she's never been treated that way. You know what I no. mean? It's always just like, oh, wow, great work, Nancy. We're so surprised that you were able to do this or whatever. And so it's just like he's tasking her with solving. Also, we're on like book eight or book six. six. Sorry. So like, how, how, what, 
How okay. long have you had this relationship? You know what I mean? Like, it just doesn't seem like we're not on like book 40. You know what I mean? Where right. it's like she's repeatedly done this over and over again. And like, as readers, we're like, okay, we know who Chief McGinnis is. They have this established relationship. At this point, it's still pretty new. You know what I mean? And just like through phone calls or whatever. So it's like, you're telling me that he's like, yeah, you figure it out, Nancy. You solve it. Yeah. Wild. Um, yeah, but so um, they're on the phone still and Nancy like tells him about the cult that she's like discovered up here or whatever. And he says, hold on, I'm going to look up the name Black Snake Colony in my quote unquote report of all cults. Okay. Does that exist? Is that a thing that exists for local police departments? I understand, like, probably the FBI has, like, a watch list for cults sure. or something. But, like... Chief McGinnis would also, not, probably. Chief McGinnis would not. And also, it's not going to be on all cults that exist. There's no report that is going to be like, this is a list of all the cults that exist in North America. And this... No, you can't... There's no way to know that. And so he comes back to the phone or whatever and is like, yeah, no, I don't have that cult listed. Well, go figure. <laughs> yeah. Surprise, surprise. Oh, my goodness. Surprise, surprise. He is like, you know, he, in the next chapter he does like, well, they're probably really recent, uh, but you should keep an eye on them, you know. Yeah, just case. too new to like, be on my complete list. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, you can only suspend your disbelief so far, and I think I draw the line at reports of all cults. That's where I draw the line in this book. Fair. Very fair. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad he did at least say, like, oh, they might just be too new to be on my list, but it was still, like, You have okay. a list? <laughs> all right. It would be different if it's, like, I have a list of cults known to operate in this area. Yeah, or right? like I'm investigating because I feel like this group right. in River Heights is doing something, but mm -hmm. it's not every cult in at least the whole state. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> so yeah. Um, and Nancy tells the boarders and Miss Bird about all about this, and they express concern over her interest in this. Um, they're, they really discourage Nancy from investigating this at all. They don't think it's appropriate for a young girl to be mixed up with that. And Nancy appeals to Mrs. Bird because she thinks that they are doing something illegal. You know, she would probably want to know because they're renting her land. And so Miss Bird agrees. She's like, yeah, actually, it probably would be really good to know if something was going on, at least so that I know that illegal stuff isn't going on on my property. So Nancy recruits uh, Bess, George, and Joanne to help her investigate. Um, and they decide that they are going to start looking at that cave. Um, we learn that it has double entrances. So there's one, like one entrance on the side of the red gate farm and the other entrance is like closer to the side of where the black snake colony has their tent set up and everything. Um, so they think that, you know, maybe we'll, we'll be able to sneak in. If we go in like one entrance of the cave, we'll be able to come back out the other way and see, you know, get closer to the cult and see what they're doing over there. Um, and they also agree not to tell anyone about their plan except Mrs. Bird. Um, so they go and they watch the hillside for the next couple of days and they don't really see any more activity. I guess they just like, post up on a hill somewhere and watch what's going on. Nancy starts talking to Joanne a little bit more, wanting to get more information about the cult. She's like, where did they get their food? Do they not like, do they never leave. Like what's going on here. And Joanne tells her like, no, they all, they, there's always like cars coming and going. There's always a bunch of cars parked up here. A lot of swanky cars often around the hillside. So I think that they just like have friends come and bring them food or who knows? Like, there's just, there's always just people coming and going. So it's really not that big of an issue for them, apparently. So the next day, the girls are spending some time on the porch when they look out in the direction of the cult and they see them dancing out in their sheets again. Um, so they run over through the woods to try to get a closer look at what's going on. And, and as they watch, they see a bunch of cars arrive and men step out of the cars, put the white robes on and come and join them in the dance. Um, then mm. after just like a few minutes of them all dancing around, they just stop and get in a single file line and they just walk into the cave. Okay. Spooky. So Nancy suspects that the guys who just got, had just gotten out of the car don't actually live here. And they only come to try to like make the cult appear like it's this really big group. And they're like using all these people to try to hide all their nefarious activities. So she has this brilliant idea. Hey, 
those costumes look like they'd be pretty easy to make. Um, <laughs> what if I made some robes out of Joanne's curtains <laughs> and sneak in and join them on their next ritual? So the next day, Nancy, Bess, and George do Reuben, the, the farmhand guy who's the 40-year-old with the crush on Bess. Uh, they do some of his work on the farm. And when they return, they see that that uh, buyer who had been trying to buy the farm from Mrs. Bird, um, we learn his name is Mr. Ken, and we see that he is back and he's harassing Mrs. Bird and Joanne. Um, they stand firm, but he leaves with, like, he slams the door and is like, you'll regret this. And he shouts at them, and, and then he finally goes. Dude, you already said that. Like, sorry yeah. to tell you, you already told them they'll regret it, and they haven't yet, so. Making threats? What's going on here? Um, but then later they do more chores, because... Like the middle half of the story is just doing farm chores, but Nancy <laughs> offers to bring the cow in from grazing out in the field. Um, so she goes out to get the cow, but the cow has wandered off. Um, and so she goes looking through the woods. So she's just like starts walking down the trail and she hears um, the faint noise of a cowbell. So she's like, clearly I'm on the right track. And then the trail in the woods just brings her right into the mouth of the cave. Awesome. Okay. Unexpected trip to the cave, but this is kind of what Nancy wanted to do anyway. So she's like, hey, I know mm -hmm. nobody's here to like help me with anything, but I'm going to go in. So she starts walking into the cave and a man stands up out of a bush or he's like behind the brush around the area and just like stands up out of nowhere Whoosh. and tries to grab her. <laughs> ah! Um, he's like, what are you doing here? And she's like, oh, our cow wandered off and I came back to get the cow and then I saw this cave and I just wanted to look around. He's like, that cow over there in the field? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Far away from here? And she's, she's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, the cave was on the way to the cow, so I had to go <laughs> in the cave. <laughs> And he's like, well, you go get your cow and you gotta get out of here because this property is owned by the Black Snake Colony. It's not. It's owned by Mrs. Bird and leased by the Black Snake Colony. But Nancy's <laughs> about, not about to split hairs. She doesn't say anything. Just gets the cow and she leaves. That night, though, she wakes from a fitful sleep to the sound of a car stopping outside of the house. Very spooky. Another, another mysterious car. Yeah, it's supposed to be like like 4 a.m. or something. Like it's yeah. middle of the night. And so she goes to the window and she sees a woman getting out of the car. Um, so Nancy is like, uh-uh, I'm not doing this. So she just pops her head out the window and is like, what are you doing? What do you think you're doing here? What do you want, basically? And she's like, are you Nancy Drew? She's like, yes. Again, what do you want? And she's like, I have a letter here from your father. I, I just came to bring it over. I'm just going to set it on the doorstep and I'm going to go. And she's like, I, I just had to come at night because this is a really urgent letter. Your father needed you to have this. Um, so she does. She places it on the doorstep and she gets back in the car and she she leaves. Nancy rushes downstairs to go grab the note. She noticed that it is a typed note and it's the wording is very suspicious. It's very terse, Nancy. It just she reads it and it says, uh, this is your father. I need you to come home at once. Do not contact me to ask me why and do not. Um, or what else does he say? Like, don't contact me and don't ask me why you can't yeah. contact me. Mm -hmm. You just, you have to come home, like, right now. Like, not in the morning. You have to come home right now. There's an emergency. Mm -hmm. You can't ask me any questions about it. And Nancy's like, all right, that's suspicious. Kind of strange because, like, if it was really that urgent, why wouldn't he just call? Right. Um, but, you know, maybe something something happened. But then she, like, notices this weird she gets like a whiff of the letter and she's like, wait, that's kind of weird. And she smells it. It's the blue jade perfume uh -huh. on the letter. And so that's even more strange now. Um, it definitely seems like this could be a trap. And so she decides to call home, even though the letter explicitly tells her not to. And even though it's like four o'clock in the morning, but she goes to the phone and the line is dead, which is really <laughs> ominous and scary. So mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe did Carson try to call us and we couldn't get through or has someone sabotaged the phone line very strange um and then nancy's like she like starts to like tell herself like all right i gotta go but then she stops and she's like wait you know somebody could be like lying in wait on the side of the road waiting for me to pass by and then they're gonna like attack me and grab me so maybe i shouldn't go and then miss bird wakes up and is like what are you doing and she like talks her out of leaving it's like we'll call in the morning and then if it's really like if you still can't get through you can go home whatever we'll help you do whatever you need to do in the daylight. <laughs> In the daylight, right. And so she she does. She goes back to bed and they get up at like 
six o'clock in the morning and Nancy tries to call again. Um, and unfortunately it's still not working. So she waits until Bess and George are up and they plan to go into town to make the phone call. And I think there was something else that they had to do anyway. Yeah. They had like errands to run for Mrs. Bird as well. Oh yeah. Yeah. She asked them to go yeah. get groceries or something like that. So um, they end up, uh, they're going on their way into town and they end up passing that filling station and diner where they had stopped for the Sundays on their way in. And Bess and George are like, Hey, you know, um, you need gas anyway. They have food here. We want breakfast. Why don't we just stop at this place again? Um, so Nancy gets gas there and she calls, she uses the payphone at the diner and she calls her dad and he's like, what are you talking about? No, I most certainly did not send you a letter. I would have called you if something actually was going on. You're all good. You don't need to come home. I'm fine. Whatever. But, you know, clearly somebody is doing something strange. So please be careful. It sounds like something really not good is some, is going on here. Um, so they go into the diner to get the breakfast and they immediately realize that like something is going on here. It's like really chaotic. They hear this excited conversation coming from this back office and um, then still in the middle of their conversation, two, uh, two federal agents like walk out of the office and a woman um, comes with them. They realize that it's the same waitress that they were served by the other day. And apparently there's something going on with a $20 bill. That's kind of what they're excitedly talking about. And she spots Nancy, the waitress does. And she points at Nancy and is like, there, that's the girl who gave me the counterfeit bill. I can't believe she came back to the scene of the crime. Don't let her get away. And Nancy's like, hold, what? hold on, hold on. What is going on here? Why would you accuse me of something like that? Um, and she explains to the agent, you know, my father gave me two $20 bills because I was going on this vacation and I'm, you know, I needed emergency money for traveling and stuff like that. And they're like, well, if your father gave you the money, then where did he get the money from? And she's like, well, I don't know, but he's not a counterfeiter. He didn't like <laughs> make these bills to give yeah. to me. So <laughs> like, what are you implying here? And Nancy like even tries to pay back the, the $20 bill, which actually, how much is that today? It's like over $200. $200? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So because when they paid for the Sundays, Nancy had paid with a $20 bill saying, oh, mm -hmm. I wanted to like break this she 20 to break anyway. Yeah. yeah. So that's how she ended up paying with a 20. And so Nancy has her other $20 bill and she hands it to them. It's like, well, you know, if it's that big of a deal, here's more money um, to like pay back what was the counterfeit money. And they look at it and they're like, well, this one's counterfeit as well. What do you think you're doing here? And she's like, oh my gosh. So it gets Wait, even no. worse. Is it? I thought what happened that might have been a difference then because in the revised text she doesn't pay it back it's Bess and George who scrape together their money to give it to the woman because they they're like trying to vouch for Nancy and they're like well if it's really that big of a deal here we'll, we'll you know we'll figure it out we'll pay you and they like oh. pull all their money out and pool it no, I think both happened because the original text, this is like the main difference from the original text. Something different really? happens here, oh. but uh, well, a little bit, a little bit. Um, but I think she does give it to them and they pocket the other 20 and then Bess and George make up the difference, right? I, I don't remember that, but maybe I'm misremembering. Let me look. Oh, no. Yeah, you're right. You're totally right. Oh, that's so weird. Cause I thought I thought after I finished it that um, that the twenty dollar bill that they got was from the people who got gas next to her the first time, and that the waitress was just mistaken. Because we never get an explanation. That was the original. Well, that makes so much more sense mm -hmm. because we never get an explanation at the end of the book as to why Nancy has counterfeit money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because in the or original, Nancy's has. like. Exactly. In the in the original, they, they solve it right away. And she's like, I didn't give you the counterfeit 20. Um, don't you remember the other car that like came up and pulled, paid for gas? They pulled that 20 out of their giant roll of cash and they paid for it. And the attendant guy is also there with the waitress. And he's like, no, I don't remember that. And Nancy's like, yes, you do. You remember like admiring their roll of cash and then going inside to break the 20. And he's like, oh, yeah, no, you're right. I do remember that. But in this, they're like, no, that's the only 20 we got all day. It must have been you. And then it ends up being that Nancy and Carson had the counterfeit bills somehow in their possession. Huh. And they don't explain how that happened. We're just supposed to assume that the counterfeiters were circulating this fake money all throughout River Heights. And Carson just happened to get some of them. Which wow. it sounds like a lot of River Heights is probably in that same situation. So Nancy I shouldn't guess. be treated like the culprit here. But. So yeah, uh, Bess and George scraped together the cash to pay back the money for the Sundays that the the restaurant was short of. 
Um, and then the cops or the agents start asking Nancy, they're like, well, who are you? What are you doing here? And like the door of the diner suddenly flings open and we hear a man's voice go, I'll tell you who she is. Um, and it is Carl Jr. Oh, sorry. This is the next chapter. So you, That's okay. I, it's just, it's like at this point when I read like, they, cause they like shout out like it's Carl. I'm like, who? Yeah. Who's Carl? I was like, <laughs> is this supposed to be somebody from like an early, like, is this supposed to be some recurring character that I don't remember? Someone named Carl who shows back up? No, no, no. So if you don't remember, which I don't know how you would because they only mentioned him in extre- like one paragraph in passing, this is the son of one of the boarders at Redgate. This is Carl Abbott Jr. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um and they just like act like they're really good friends like they know each other really well even though i thought all he did was like drop off his dad at redgate farm i guess he must have stayed enough to like talk talk to each other and enough for him to like come over and like be offended that she's that nancy's being called a criminal and he like vouches for her honesty even though it's like how would you know carl you don't know who this girl is I want to say in the original, they make a point to say that because um, Carl like works he in the big study, often. he like comes on the weekends to to visit, and so they got okay. to know him a little bit. But it's all right, okay, sure, okay, whatever. But so he vouches for her honesty, and then the federal agents just like believe him, and he explains about Nancy's father being like this, you know, prominent attorney or whatever. And they're like, wait, 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 the Carson Drew of River Heights. And and she's like, yes, the Carson Drew of River Heights. Like I was trying to tell you or whatever, you know, who I am and who my father is or whatever. But no, it takes this guy named Carl who we met one time to come Mm -hmm. in and be like, no, wait, no, wait, I'm a man. Listen to me. Yeah, it felt very much like we have to insert this man in here to (laughs) to give authority to Nancy's story or to Uh give legitimacy to Nancy's story and to have him be the the male hero that comes in and saves Mm -hmm. the day. Because also, like, after this, there's, like, a weird kind of romantic, like, undertone subplot situation between him and Nancy. Because let's not forget, we don't, we've not, we have not met Ned yet. Ned is not. Uh, yeah, Nancy's he's next, bow next yet. book. Yeah, he's in the next book. So of course we can have a little flirtation between Carl and Nancy, and Nancy gets to be all grateful to him for you know saving their you know skins or whatever in this situation. Um, but yeah, so the federal agents believe him, and they let them go, even after realizing that. Um, Oh, and they even eventually realized that Chief McGinnis, like, mentioned Nancy previously to them and, like, mentioned the work that she was doing on this case. So if they had, like, stopped for, like, half a second and listened to who she said she she was, they would realize, like, oh, you're the girl, you're the girl detective. We know who you are. This is ridiculous. It's very frustrating. Um even though she's annoyed, Nancy decides to also give them a heads up about the letter that she received um, and the code, like the letter supposedly from Carson, the fake letter and the code that she's working on. They take the letter and they say that they're going to take it to their handwriting analysis, which we never learn about again, um, and they leave. So then the girls, you know, finish or leave here, go into town, eat breakfast somewhere else, (laughs) (laughs) Um, and uh, run errands that they said they would run for Mrs. Bird. Um, And then they return to the farm. And they learn that, you know, they they had gotten in touch with the telephone repair company or whatever, and they had come out and fixed the phone. And they realized that the telephone that wasn't working, the line had been cut. Hmm. Sabotage indeed. Sabotage indeed. Um, so presumably that was cut by the middle of the night visitors who delivered the fake letter. Um, but the telephone is fixed now. Nancy has to like go back into town to get material for the costumes. Um, I don't know why, because she says, I guess she says she doesn't want to use Mrs. Bird's curtains to do it, which, okay, but like, why didn't you just get a in town before? Whatever. So she goes back into town. The the curtains. And then she's like, oh, that's going to use up a lot of the curtains for all four of us. (laughs) Um, So she goes back into town and on her way, she sees a woman limping, kind of like rushing along, but limping on the side of the road. Um, 
so she stops her car and she offers the woman a lift and sees that she's the cult member with the hurt ankle that she had met in the woods previously. Um, so the woman gratefully accepts the ride because, of course, her ankle is still in pain and injured. Um, but she also, like, is, like, nervously looking over her shoulder to see if she's being followed. Mm. Oh. Spooky. Um, but Nancy is, like, tactful. Um, but, but she she asks her first why she doesn't use one of the Colts' cars to, like, come into town. And the woman says that we aren't allowed much freedom. Um, mm. And also they don't know that they're, they don't know that I'm gone. Uh, what? All right. Um, so Nancy is like, tries not to ask too many questions in case this woman is like fleeing this cult. But I'm like, excuse me. If, if somebody is like, furtively looking over their shoulder like the cult doesn't allow me much freedom you're not going to ask questions because you're trying to be tactful because you don't want to ask questions in case the woman is fleeing for her life shouldn't you be like um are you in danger do you need help can i take you to the authorities or can i get you out of town like right she should be asking more questions right. <laughs> like what can i do what do you need where do you want to go let's get you uh -huh. out of here um but whatever eventually they get to the reason that the woman is going into town is to post a letter that she wants to get in the mail this morning nancy offers to take it for her uh, but the woman says she doesn't want nancy to get into trouble um, because the cult forbids contact with the outside world um, but she you know wants to send this letter to her sister but she doesn't you know want nancy to help her do this because she doesn't want i guess any trouble to come to nancy because of her help um oh, that's so sad. Nancy, I know, now realizing, oh, how dire this situation must be, they don't even let you talk to your sister, asks if she can help her run away. Um and, you know, basically saying, like, well, you know, you're out now, they don't know where you are. Can like can we take you somewhere now? Basically. Um and the woman thinks basically she tells her, like, no, I'm beyond help. I'm in too deep. Aww. That's awful. And, yeah, and so Nancy, like, tries to talk to her more about it or whatever, but she just, like, refuses to talk about it anymore and doesn't want to drag Nancy into it any more than she already has. But she's clearly very scared, um, but she just insists that Nancy drops her off at the post office and tells her, like, no, 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 I'll find my own way back. Thank you for your help. So Nancy doesn't really have a choice but to do what she asks. Um... Later, Nancy is in the checkout line of the grocery store, and Nancy overhears two women gossiping about the Black Snake Colony, because I guess they're, like, known out and about in town. Um, and they're, like, talking about how, you know, oh, they must be up to no good, like, cavorting about in bedclothes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, yeah, that's pretty accurate. Um, and, like, the, the women, I guess, are, like, discussing getting a group together to, like, go do something about it. It's kind of unclear as to, like, what they plan on doing. I guess, like, talking to, like, local government or something about... No, I think they were just going to go complain to Mrs. Bird and be like, you have to make oh. them leave. And, you know, oh, okay. that be it. Just make their complaints <laughs> known. Oh, my gosh. Okay, yeah. Um, but so, sensing that this might throw a wrench um, into their, like, infiltrating plans nancy uh decides that well we better try to infiltrate the cult tonight before you know anything changes with you know this situation um so that afternoon back at redgate farm all the girls work like mad to sew their costumes but unfortunately there's no cult ritual that night so nothing for the girls to join in on um you know so they have to wait so the next day nancy bess and george go swimming in a nearby pond and then on the way back, George decides to jump around on some rocks because it's George. And she gets bitten by a snake. <laughs> Excellent. Um, yeah, it's an interesting scene. Uh, the snake slithers away before they're able to identify it and, you know, whether or not it's um, venomous. So Nancy decides to take precautionary first aid with a pair of scissors that she just happens to have with her. I guess she takes it everywhere, um, including swimming. Um, and Bess pours her blue jade perfume that she also has with her going swimming on the pair of scissors to sterilize the pair of scissors. 
Can perfume sterilize things? I mean, it has a little bit of alcohol in it, but I feel like the other ingredients would just, like, make the scissors sticky or, like, undo the sterilization that comes from the alcohol. It's a stretch at best. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And then Nancy cuts open George's leg yeah. to get any potential venom out. Listen. I don't know what kind of first aid they're teaching in those 1940 schools, but man, oh man. <laughs> this was an intense scene because as soon as it happens, Nancy's like, well, I know what to do. And she's just like, pulls the scissors out and gets to work. I know. And, oh! Seriously, it's like, where did you learn how to do this? Akin to the rubbing of the wrists of, the, the, of Joanne in the train. It's like... Where did you learn to cut open someone's leg? I mean, I've heard of, like, sucking the venom out of someone's leg right. wound. But I have never heard cut it open. But I guess that's what you do, and then you suck it out. But she just doesn't, she doesn't suck it out. She just lets it run out. Well, they, um, they put a tourniquet above and right. below the bite. Because I yeah. think Bess and George both take their scarves off or, or mm-hmm. something, and they tie it. So it's just the like area of the bite that's draining out and then they're like we got to carry you back so that you don't move your foot so that you don't like bleed out basically it's oh it's god very, yeah i thought it was just that she couldn't walk because she had her leg cut open and tourniqueted <laughs> yeah well i mean she probably would have had trouble walking right. but also they're like we don't want you to like move so the blood starts flowing faster or anything like that wow. so they wow, just, wow, wow. then they decide to carry her home yeah it's an intense scene um and creepy and gross or whatever um also on their way home um they're carrying george between them and george makes a comment about you know how they're so lucky that she doesn't eat dessert like Bess does um because they can carry her home and if it was best they'd be having a much harder time so unnecessary and she like bessie what even, a like fucking bitch Bitch. Bessie tries to like almost be nice about it and is like, I don't know what you mean, George. And George is like, Oh, you know exactly what I mean. I'll if explain. I ate like you, I'd be too heavy. And if then I jo- ate like you, I'd be fat. Oh my god. And Bess doesn't even really say anything to her besides like, Oh, well, you know, thanks for being grateful that I would help you in this way. I'm yeah. literally carrying you because you've got a snake your- bite. Because you were doing something stupid. And you got yourself bitten by a snake. You weren't paying attention. And I'm carrying you. And you're insulting me and, like, shaming me for my my weight? What, why is that necessary? Bess is like, oh, thanks for, you know, the thanks that I get for doing all this for you. Okay. Nancy, and Nancy does what she always does, which is, like, make a remark and, like, try to, like, move past it. Does, mm-hmm. Not addressing it, but just, like... Let's let's not talk about that. Come on, guys. Let's change the subject to something nice. Stick up for your friend, Nancy. Drop George on her ass and make her crawl home. <laughs> oh. Okay, anyway. Um, so they get home that evening. George is fully recovered from the snake bite ordeal. Um, and Nancy realizes, after having had this, you know, snake encounter, um, that, oh, Snakes move in a squiggly line. <laughs> oh. So, so. Write that one the, down, guys. The, the squiggly line over the two in the code must stand for Black Snake Colony. And that that means that the 18 probably stands for Redgate Farm. Because 18 is the, or R is the 18th letter. And yeah. just the letter R must mean Redgate Farm. Right. 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 What else could it be? (laughs) I don't know, man. I don't know. Wow. Unfortunately, she doesn't have time to notify the police um, because they have to quickly don their costumes and hurry off to hide in the woods um, so that they can be there in time to join in on the cult's dance that night. Um, so sure enough, they hide in the woods and they see all the cult members arrive and start to dance. Um, and they, they leave Joanne like back in the woods as like a lookout. And then Nancy, Bess and George don their costumes and join in to the dance. (laughs) You want to take it? Oh, yes. 
Uh, so Nancy kind of notices that the dance, um, she, she's kind of worried about fitting in because she doesn't know the dance moves, but then she, um, she's like, wait, everybody's just kind of doing their own thing, just literally flapping their arms at random. So I'm just going to do that too. Um, but then as she's like moving around and cause they're all like kind of going in a circle and as she's moving around the circle, she, she overhears the other dancers say, say weird things like it, it indicates to her that nobody's taking this seriously because they're all talking about like this ought to give those country yokels an eyeful and this all this uh, this cult stuff was a foolish idea anyway and oh can't we be done already and i'm tired and like they're all just like complaining and making these weird remarks um so they finish the dance and they start to head towards the cave and nancy realizes that because uh, they're like getting that single file line again and they march into the cave um, and they think that they're all in the clear, but then Nancy realizes that there is, they have like a sentry posted at the mouth of the cave and everyone has to tell a password to them to get into the cave. Um, so she like tails the person in front of her, like right up next behind them so that she can overhear what they say. And then she overhears the password. And then when it's her turn, she like yells it to the person <laughs> so that Bess and George behind her can also hear it. And then, um, so they do, they tell the code and they get in. Um, and so they go into like a inner like room of the cave and they all like go and sit in on the ground in a circle. And Nancy realizes that the blue jade perfume, uh, like the smell is really strong. She realizes that several people in the room must be wearing it. And that, you know, that man on the train that asked her about the chief thing, she's like, oh, clearly that guy mistook me because all the cult members wear this perfume. Um, but then a man steps up in front of everyone in the circle and takes off his headdress. And Nancy suspects that this must be Maurice Hale because he's acting like he's the leader of the group, right? And then a second man takes off his headdress and Nancy recognizes him as the man from the office. I guess Al was his name, right? The office where Joe had interviewed Joe, Joanne, Joanne had interviewed. They call her Joe sometimes. Um, and he hands the leader an envelope and says, here's the good money. Perfect score this time for our main distribution department. All right, strange. So he also tells us, though, that he thinks that a plainclothes police officer has been hanging out around that office where Joanne had interviewed for the job. Um, and he tells us that, you know, I think it's time to move on from what we're doing right now because, like, the police are definitely catching on to us. And I definitely think that somebody was watching us the other day. We need to, like, wrap this whole business up real quick and get out of here. And Maurice, the leader, is like, uh, no, I think it's fine. Like, I would have heard something by now from one of my sources if we need to hurry but we have at least another week before we need to start thinking about moving on so do what i say basically um and then al brings up yvonne and it was like you know yvonne shouldn't have sold that girl that perfume bottle this is kind of her fault um and then yvonne speaks up and is like no that's not my fault because those girls were so insistent on buying the perfume for me <laughs> so we learn yvonne is clearly here as well and then we learn that uh, maurice had actually placed yvonne's um, placed her in the guy's office for whatever reason. It was his decision that she should go work in that, that office downtown. Um, and then Al asked Maurice to come up with a new code because he feels like the girls are getting close to their operation. Mm, okay, interesting. I should say so. They were right here. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then Maurice is like, actually, yeah, that's a good point. We'll do that. Um, and then he tells everyone, hey, let's go into the next room of the cave, the workroom to get your cut and we'll dole out the amounts for next week. And Nancy, Bess and George are like, Oh, what does that mean? That's kind of strange. Um, so they follow him into the next room and they see that they've very clearly got a counterfeiting operation set up in here. They've got the big equipment. There's big piles of bills everywhere. She notices that it's mostly 20. So like really large denominations. Um, and so this must be the business that the Hale syndicate is engaged in. They're covering up by pretending to be the black snake colony um, to like, you know, scare people away from coming near the cave so that they can counterfeit their fake money. And then no one will really bat an eye at the weird behavior that they're doing. Nancy is able to pocket a fake 20 when no one's looking and she is trying to like communicate with Bess and George a little bit like non-verbally to try to come up with a plan because now it's getting a little, um, dicey. looking a little dicey. That's the word I was looking for. Thank you. <laughs> it's getting a little dicey of how they're going to manage to get out of here without anyone noticing what's going on because now more and more people in the group are starting to take off their headdresses and their masks and we can see who they are. 
Um, we do also learn that the woman who left the the note from Carson telling her to come home, that woman is here as well. And she hears, um, she like says something aloud that confirms to us that, yeah, she was the one who cut the phone line. And now things are looking a little bit more grim as well, because Al is standing directly in front of the only exit to the room. And Marie starts to uh, go around the room and like get stacks of money and is distributing to each of the members. And then as he does that, that member will remove their mask at that time. So Nancy starts to realize, oh my gosh, we are going to have to make a run for it here pretty soon because there's like only five other people, including us, left in this room who don't have masks on at this point. So we have like minutes before we're discovered um but just as maurice points it best to remove her hood um he's like you why don't you have your hood off yet take it off right now but then before she can do that there's this commotion in the like i guess the hallway area of the cave and the guard who was um the one who had like scared nancy off when she was looking for the cow he comes in from like the other side of the cave like he'd come down the other entrance and he is dragging someone who is like trying to get away and it's joanne he'd oh. found her like because she she was still outside playing lookout and he found her and drags her in with the rest of the girls poor joanne so yeah this is awful on a few different levels here joanne our like getaway person who was going to go run for help in the event nancy Bess, and george getting into trouble she has now been captured and can't go for help um they have no backup um they didn't tell like mrs bird or anyone at the place that they were doing anything more than just like sitting on the hillside watching the dancing going on Mm -hmm. and they can't reveal themselves yet so this means that they can't do anything to help joanne either so okay but now maurice is like commanding everyone to remove their masks because he is very much on like he's very suspicious of this but bess and george and nancy all like refuse and so he just like goes over and rips it off of them and is like well clearly y'all are the intruders here and so they start to de like the whole group starts to debate how they're gonna take care of these four girls what they're gonna do to get them out of the way it's a horrifying conversation it is a really it's horrifying the scariest conversation. part of the book because he's like well some people are like well, let's just tie them up and leave them here and then maurice is like no because like They'll be missed and Mrs. Bird will like send out a search party. And as soon as they look here, they'll find the girls. So what we should do is just like there was that shack by the river and no one goes out there. So let's take them to the shack in the river, tie them up, leave them in the shack um, and let them starve to death. <laughs> Very horrifying thought. And the so at, at this point, we hear another woman speak up and she's just so horrified at the thought of doing that to Nancy Best, George and Joanne that she starts to protest. And we realize this is the woman who had the injured ankle that Nancy had tried to help. Um, and she goes over to Maurice and starts begging, like, don't do this to them. I know you're not this cruel. You're not the man that I married. You weren't mm -hmm. like this when I first met you. And so we learn that this is her husband. She's the wife of the, the leader of this. And that's why she's in so deep with this cult that she can't get away. Um, and he backhands her and she falls to the floor and says horrible things to her as well about like what he's going to do and like he should never should have married her because she's such a whiny little brat and like mm -hmm. all this horrible stuff. And she starts to like protest more against him and then he just like is like beating her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. so she just like kind of goes into the corner and slumps over and like has basically given up on helping herself or Nancy Best George and Joanne at this point. But at this commotion, Nancy realizes that she has a moment of opportunity here because nobody's looking at the door. So she makes a break for it. And she kind of like gets Bess and George's eye contact and like, you know, signals to them as well. So they all three of them start to run and they t overtake Al Sneed, but he manages to grab Bess and George and only Nancy is able to get away. She struggles a little bit with them, but she does get out of the room and she like stops for a second and looks back at Bess and George. She's like, what am I going to do? How am I going to help them? And then we all got to come back for Joanne. Um, and then Bess and George are like, no, Nancy, you got like, go, go, go. Run. Don't even think about us. So she yeah. starts running. Um, she runs through the tunnel and she ends up going um, out like the, the back way that's closed closer to the farm um, where she'd been with the cow previously. And she, she does, she makes it, she makes it to the mouth of the cave. She keeps running and then someone grabs her. No. Uh, so we realize that this is the man named Hank that we've seen before from the car. Um, she tries to get, a, uh, get away, but she is not able to, um, and is eventually led back into the cave and like 
tied up with the rest of the girls. Then Maurice starts, like, giving the orders for everyone to start, like, moving and, like, destroying, like, their equipment and everything they have here, all the evidence, um, and tells them to go ahead and start taking the girls out to the shack. Um, oh. So start. Um, they leave them out of the cave, uh, still all tied up or whatever, but once they reach the opening, Nancy sees Carl Jr. standing there. Um, and so she shouts at him, like, hey! run carl these people are counterfeiters like you know get out of here go get help or whatever um but instead of running carl uh makes this like signal um and a bunch of federal agents jump out from behind bushes to arrest all the syndicate members maurice is very upset at having been outwitted by a quote-unquote snooping kid uh, which i thought (laughs) was a very funny line um but, you know, they're all arrested. Carl explains that Mrs. Bird found their costume supplies, like, up in their room where they were working. And worry, and she worried that they had come here. So um, Carl happened to be visiting that evening. So um, she told Carl about it. And Carl decided to call the federal agents and then come here to their rescue. Um, Nancy is highly praised by the agents for her skill in cracking a, quote-unquote, uncrackable code. Um, and solving a case that baffled the government. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and they all head back to Redgate Farm. Everybody's like happy, proud of the girls for like, you know, being so daring or whatever. Um, but now, you know, with the land no longer being rented to the Black Snake Colony, the farm is back in financial trouble. But Nancy is like, oh, don't worry about that. I've had this great idea we can open up the cave to sightseers for money. <laughs> so, it's actually not a bad idea. <laughs> it's honestly. not. Yeah. Um, so later in the week, they set up like this whole display in the cave. They like put like dummies in there, I guess, representing like the hail syndicate. They put up like a, a printing press and they like litter the place of like fake money. <laughs> um. And then, like, a couple weeks later, I guess Carson comes to visit. He's, like, finished up with whatever work he's been doing on whatever case. And he comes to visit Redgate Farm. And the place is, like, hopping. There's, like, cars all over the place. People are, like, lining up outside the cave to go see it or whatever. Um, And even more people are now staying on at Redgate Farm as boarders. Um, So, you know, their money problems are solved. And... Carson praises Nancy, you know, for her success and says, I can't decide whether you're better as a detective or a promoter. Ugh. The end. (laughs) Well, I mean, she certainly didn't do a whole lot of detecting in this in this book, I gotta say. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, (sighs) it's just the ending is so disappointing to me. Yeah. Because they don't do anything. It, I would have I would have rather had them get let out to the cave, trapped in the cave. Nancy has them find a way out of the cave, get out of their bindings, escape. Mm-hmm. They go back to the cave. It's empty. All the evidence is destroyed. And then they call the police or whatever, and they catch them on the road. But they're like, but we don't have evidence. And then Nancy pulls out the $20 bill she pocketed from Aww, the cave. That would have been so good. Wouldn't it? Oh. Instead, instead, freaking Carl Evan Jr. rolls up with his federal agents. I'm yeah. sorry. What? Nancy gets rescued? That's the ending to this? Nancy gets rescued? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, it was left a real sour note in my mouth. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the differences between the original yes. and the revised. Because the ending pretty much plays out the same way but there's a few little differences so um starting from the beginning here as we said Bess doesn't break the bottle of perfume it's george that does that um another difference it's a bunch of like tiny things that it's like why would you change this it has absolutely no bearing on the plot no bearing on the story whatsoever Mm -hmm. um so joanne bird is millie bird (laughs) b-u-r-d we're in the revised she's b-y-r-d um but yeah her, her name was millie in the original don't know why um, Nancy doesn't work out the code, like at all. We get a like a chapter where she tries really hard and it stumps her. <laughs> she gets Carson's help. She reads to that whole book that he gave her. She tries for a really, really long time and just cannot figure it out. 
Okay. We don't have Chief McGinnis at all because he hasn't been invented yet in this, mm-hmm. the series. Um, so any of the scenes with him where we get the information about like the guy from Texas who had rented the car that they had seen, none of that happens. Right. There's no man trying to buy the farm. It's just, yeah, she does have money problems because she's leveraged her mortgage against the second like half of the property, but mm-hmm. there's nobody like threatening her. There's no weird note from Carson. Like there's no that um in the original, the only women that we meet or like are specifically identified are the woman in the the woods who breaks her ankle or whatever, and then Yvonne Wong. There's no like third lady who's in the car that's always mm. with the perfume and delivers mm-hmm. the note. She's just not in it. Um, Carson's not the one that, or Carson never gave Nancy fake counterfeit money. Her money was actually not counterfeit in it. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's no snake incident either with George. Like they don't go swimming, anything like that. Okay. So what happens with the counterfeit money is they, the very first time that they're at that diner, like we said, Nancy goes to pay for the, the gas, but the other car rolls up, they pay with the 20, the attendant goes outside or goes inside, breaks the 20, comes back, give him, gives him the change. And then Nancy gets her gas, goes inside, pays with the $20 bill, gets her change, and then they leave. And then they come back. And then instead of the scene where or there's still the scene where they, they accuse her, but in this scene... Mm-hmm. There's no, like, don't you know who I am? I'm Nancy Drew. There's no, like, finding out that Carson had had the counterfeit money. Um, They just are like, oh, okay, well, I guess, yeah, we do remember that that other car gave us the, gave us a 20 as well. So it could have been Mm -hmm. them that gave us the counterfeit money instead of you. Um, And it's also not secret service agents. It's just regular cops that come. And there's two cops there. Um, And then they let Nancy go, but then she comes back and she's like, I just thought of something. I have this code that I've been completely unable to crack. (laughs) Maybe it'll help you in your, your search. So she gives them the code and they leave, but then they kind of look at each other and they're like, no, this girl's suspicious. This is weird. So they follow Nancy and they end up tailing her. Um, but then they see that she goes back to Redgate Farm, like she said she was going to do. So they're like, okay, well, she did tell the truth on that. So I guess we'll just leave it alone for now. But at least we know where she is if, you know, if we do need to follow up on this in the case. Um, and then, of course, everything else happens and they're trapped in the cave and everything. And it is actually, um, Carl Jr. does still come with the agents, but only because the agents like came looking or the police came looking for Nancy because they sent the code off to Washington to get decoded and then they learn from that decoding that this this time and place is where the next meeting okay. is going to be and they're like oh okay. okay well let's go to the cave at this time and they go that in and so they, much more sense. they find nancy bess and george and joanne all tied up in there that's so much better yeah so wow. that's the whole thing with the the code and, and all of that so i mean it sounds to me like the revision screwed up the plot here <laughs> like a little bit for sure wow i i do like that in the revise that they made nancy like figure it out a little bit but they also yeah. made the code so easy at least in my mind that it's like nancy how did you not do this on your own and then chief <sighs> mcginnis also couldn't do it and then whoever he asked for help with that also couldn't do it. It ended up coming down to Nancy solving it anyway. That is so <laughs> annoying. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I just, I, 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 I'm of very two minds about it. Like, obviously all this stuff is upsetting. And I feel like the plot ha- didn't make sense in a lot of, ways we didn't even talk about the perfume but like why it is like they go into the cave but they don't realize that you know nancy doesn't belong or whatever until they pull off her hood and realizes realize that she's not a cult member so clearly they know each other like they know enough about who's supposed to be there and who's not supposed to be there so that they can identify people based on sight but then why do they need the perfume to like identify each other. And why does that man think that Nancy is a cult member on the train? Clearly he knows who's involved in the cult and who's not. I kind of assume that like everybody who is in the the meetings with the cults are like higher ups in the organization that it's actually a lot larger and that most of the people there like al had yvonne but he also probably has like several other people that do the distribution for him that aren't necessarily involved in the making of the money but the man on the train is there 
Right. But like maybe the man on the train was expecting to meet up with someone to give them money so that oh. they could go and distribute it for them. And the, the distributors oh. don't necessarily need to be in that meeting. It's just for the higher ups that make the money, even though there's quite a few higher ups that are there. And then but maybe then, that's how they identify each other. But, but that's then why was the question to Nancy any word from the chief? Wouldn't he be the one with the word from the chief? Right. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Yeah, that doesn't work as a theory at all. <laughs> I just, it just is, I understand that perfume is a way to draw Nancy into the mystery. I get it, I get it, I get it. But, like, it just doesn't make any sense. It's just it a plot device that does not make any sense. Um, it would have made sense if, like, the only way they got into the cave was the blue jade perfume. If like, they were smelling like it or something. If they smelled like it or something. And because they had it, that was how they were able to get in. And they didn't realize until she took off her, you know headdress or whatever like oh that's nancy drew we mm -hmm. know nancy drew because we know nancy drew's been investigating right. right but it wasn't that yeah it's just it's just they're intruders get them you know well and that's why i thought that the because at the beginning yvonne is like no i know that there's a large quanti large quantity of it here but it's already been purchased so we can't sell it to you i thought that that's why there was so much of it because like mm. oh we have to distribute many many bottles to many right. people who are doing like the the leg work on the ground level here it's okay. like maybe i can also, stretch but probably not <laughs> so this blue jade perfume is supposed to be an Asian perfume. It's supposed to be one of the imports from the Hale Syndicate, right? Correct, yes. So if the Hale Syndicate is just a criminal operation, you know, that's actually doing counterfeiting or whatever, I guess in addition to importing illegal goods or whatever, why are they selling the perfume if they want it to be like a signal between their cult? It's from them. It's not like it's just some random perfume they're getting from somewhere else. Right. It's their that's perfume. Weird. Why are you selling it if you don't want anybody else to be able to use it? Or why are you selling it in a store where anybody can come buy it? Sell it like only to the people in your cult. Yeah. Just keep it in the back room or don't bring it to the yeah. store at all. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Anyway, okay. So like I'm of two minds about it because the plot definitely doesn't make any sense. How they, no. the, how they got here is just a weird trail of breadcrumbs yeah. that does not make any sense. And it also it, it also doesn't feel like a Nancy Drew book to me because Nancy isn't doing any real investigating. The um, like the code cracking that she's doing is taking like a long time and it's weird and it doesn't seem plausible. Nancy is rescued at the end by some rando guy. The rando guy has to like lend credibility to Nancy, whereas in most I feel like most Nancy Drew mystery stories, Nancy is like, oh, this is what's happening. And then, you know, authority figures fall over their feet to listen to her, accommodate her and, you know, follow that or whatever. But that's not what happens. Mm -hmm. um, not that that's not realistic, but um, that it just didn't feel like a Nancy Drew book because it <laughs> was realistic in that yeah. way, you know. <laughs> um, but I really enjoyed reading it. Because it was, it was fun. It was a fun read. Man. Very exciting. Yeah. It was very exciting. It was suspenseful. It was spooky and creepy and scary. And I have never I have never read a scarier Nancy Drew book. I, I've never been more scared. And I think part of it is because it's not like a ghost haunting kind of a story where it's like clearly like, okay, somebody's trying to steal somebody's money. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like these are bad criminal men right. who are like threatening and like leaving notes and potentially waiting on roadsides to like harm you and are going to tie you up and leave you in a shack to starve and are beating their Ugh. wives and are like out on the hillside dressed as KKK members to scare people away, like standing in front of like cave you know, cave entrances and scaring you off and saying like, you shouldn't be here. Like, and also that like combined with like the spooky nature of like the country at night and like these hills True. and the True. storms, Ugh. it was very atmospheric. Yes. Um, I like that part of it. And I was just like, so excited about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. yeah it started off great it was really promising yeah. it's like yeah oh, that's yeah. how you're gonna end it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think it would be really well adapted if you could just solve the plot issues which i feel like are easily solvable oh, um, this would make a great movie or even a tv make, episode it would yeah mm -hmm. so spooky 
Mm-hmm. So scary. Ooh. Yes. Yeah. 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 You could really play up the visuals on this one if you were uh-huh. to adapt it into a, a screen. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, goodness. And just kind of like a rundown farm mm-hmm. and like, yeah. Yeah. The spooky cave in the dark and. Uh huh. Going through the woods and like even the snake bite. The snake bite would mm-hmm. make such a great scene. Be gruesome. Like George just oh. suddenly being like, ah. And then Nancy having to like perform surgery and like the dirt <laughs> off the scissors and the perfume. Can you imagine? And... <laughs> Can you imagine? That would be pretty great, wouldn't it? <laughs> I'm making me excited just thinking about it. <laughs> Get on it, please. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness! Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. Okay. And do we have any other thoughts? <laughs> Just a small one. And I know that we are only on book six in the series, so it's very yeah. early on. But why do Nancy and Carson not have some sort of emergency code word? <laughs> Especially after the events of the haunted staircase. Like, why You're don't they so have right. something that's like, hey, if you get a message from me saying like, hey, you need to come home immediately, that uh, I'm in danger and you're in danger and you need to do this right now. And this random stranger is telling you, like, unless they also say the word parsnip, don't believe them, you know, like have a secret, <laughs> n- not parsnip, but some secret code yeah. word where it's like, actually, this is legitimate. Like, why did they not have something like that? You are so right. You are so it. right. Because it comes with up the amount all the of time. times. <laughs> yes, the amount of times that Carson is used against Nancy, or Nancy is used against Carson to mm-hmm. get them to, as like traps or whatever or to get them to leave or to go somewhere or to do something, is is unmatched. They mm-hmm. have they, that. You're so right. That's advice that like they give to like families and like kids like today. Hey, like have a yeah. code word. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh, I wish. I w- and that would have been smart so enough. Good. I know yeah. that that wasn't the common advice back in 1930 or 1961, but like, come mm-hmm. on, like Nancy's smart enough, and Carson's smart enough. Surely, between the two of them, they could have worked out a system that, like, this is happening enough times now that yeah. we need to know if we're really actually safe <laughs> and if <laughs> so each true. other is okay, so that we don't have to put ourselves in danger to go protect the other one. Like, oh, come and on. I- I just love it so much when Nancy outwits the baddies. Like, yeah, it's like so satisfying, and to like be able to have like Nancy just just know, like mm-hmm. this is not on the level. You know yeah. what I mean? Like he didn't say, you know, with all my love, Dad. He just mm-hmm. said Dad at the end. He didn't sign off in the right way, so right. I know it's not actually him. You know, mm-hmm. that yeah. always is nice. But we would know for sure, Nancy, <gasps> if would, he just said, like... If we just had to set that up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, <sighs> yeah. I will say I got a lot of skills that I got to add to Nancy's uh, repertoire from this book. Just the first aid skills, I think. Oh, yes, like yes. Just unmatched. I do have a question, though, not related to first aid skills, unrelated, totally. Um, why did Nancy pocket the 20 and what does she do with it? Because oh, he, good question. she does not turn that over to the agents at the end, I don't believe, unless I missed it. Hmm. She keeps it. <laughs> Maybe, you know how every, at the end of every one, she like has some sort of souvenir from that mystery? Oh, like that's her the, souvenir. The old clock. Maybe she keeps this as her, just for I was her memories. Say, I was like, is Nancy getting her money back for that Sunday? <laughs> like, is that what this is about? Honestly, she probably just glues it into her scrapbook or something oh like that. Oh, God. <laughs> With, like, a big arrow that says, counterfeit bill! Exclamation <laughs> point. Such a dork. Oh, my gosh. That's funny. Oh, yeah. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. That would have been yeah. so good if what you said had happened <laughs> where she like pulls it out at the end and it's the evidence. I thought that I thought that's where we were going because they were talking about how like they're destroying all the evidence, right? Like mm-hmm. they're, you know, getting rid of their equipment or whatever. I was like, okay, well, so that's why, you know, the twenty dollars that she pocketed is gonna come into play. She's gonna be able to provide that as evidence. Nope. 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 Unnecessary. Yeah. I thought it was still good. It was still good. It's just, I, I would make a lot of changes. <laughs> yeah, same. Props to the writer. Who wrote this? Was this Mildred Wirt Benson? The original no. was, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, the, yeah. Uh, right. the other person that we mentioned did the revised. But is the original text still just as, like, spooky and, like, 
Oh, yeah. Of course it is. Of course. Of course I came from Mildred. So props to Mildred Moore Benson. Yeah, maybe more so. More spooky because it's, um, Mm -hmm. I mean, all the same spooky things happen, but because it's longer, it's drawn out. Like we have a lot longer of a scene where they're in the woods, like trying to drive and get away from the storm. And yeah. Love it. Love it. Sorry, you were going to say something else. Oh, I wrote a page number down, meaning that I wanted to quote something, but I looked at mm-hmm. it and it's just the 40-year-old hitting on Bess, or yeah. George saying she'll break another heart. And then Bess responded, it says Bess responded with a good-natured retort. Bess, we don't you don't have to be nice it. about that. Yeah, we don't even know what she says, but you don't have to be nice. You can just be like, ew, George, you're being inappropriate and gross. Don't talk like that. <laughs> Nobody calls George out on her bullshit. Yeah. Except us, I guess. Except us. <laughs> Somebody has to do it. Yeah. I can be that person. We need a shirt that says, somebody needs to call George Fain out on her bullshit. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, goodness. Yeah. I think that's all I got for this one, though. Me too. Me too. Score? I really wanted to like it because it was really a fun one. But everything Uh you said about the plot and the mystery itself is just, it's, so accurate i can't give it more than a three a three it feels fair yeah see part of me wants to give it a one because okay. of all this and yeah. part of me wants to give it a five yeah. <laughs> it's so so i think i just have to split the difference and you know what i'll give it like <sighs> okay i'll give it a 3.5 okay because i really enjoyed reading it, it you know what i mean thing. And it was yeah. it was it was a really good read. So as frustrating as all this stuff is and how random and off the wall or whatever, it was a good read. It was a yeah. good read. You know? Definitely so. fun. Yeah. All righty. Yeah. Well, do you want to tell them what we're gonna read next? I would love to. So next up, we are gonna be covering another mystery story. This time, number eight, Nancy's mysterious letter. Oh, I've I have zero. I have no idea what this one is about. I haven't even looked at it. I think all that I know about it is that she is also wearing pink on the cover. So, Oh, maybe that, that'll be the trend of this one. We'll only yeah. look at books that where Nancy's wearing pink. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Really but <laughs> I think it's like a little, um, like a pink suit, like a blazer okay. and skirt or something like that. Let me just grab it because I probably yeah, just... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, no, it's just like a little, like, a, I guess it's like a suit jacket and a skirt. Cute. Cute. Okay, but that outfit is way better it's than way the better. one that she is wearing on Secret of Redgate Farm. First of all, her hair is a much better color. It's not this mm-hmm. weird, like, yellow blonde. It's, like, very Titian. And I think that even though it doesn't, like, you know, match well with the pink, it's it's it doesn't match in an intentional way. You know what I mean? But the rest of the paint, like the rest of the outfit does match the rest itself. Of the, the outfit you know? matches. But I mean like with Nancy's coloring where this yellow right. really clashes, which like with like this mauvey kind of pink, that like hot pink with her Titian mm-hmm. hair is a look. It's it's nice. It works really <laughs> well. Yeah. <laughs> I will say in Redgate Farm, Nancy's described as blonde in both both texts. So. Oh, okay. I will I want to riot. It's just there's no continuity. Yeah. It's there's no continuity with the mm-hmm. Nancy's hair color. And so the only thing I can think of is that Nancy does dye her hair. She must. She just has to. There's just no other explanation. She's blonde in one, she's redheaded in another. She's different shades of redheaded all the time. She's different shades of blonde. She dyes her hair. Okay? Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I present to you the case <laughs> <laughs> of Nancy Drew's hair color. And she dyes her hair. That's it. That's the only explanation. There is no other explanation. It's got to be true. <laughs> you know, have you seen how people like make like those PowerPoints of like, just like their, what they're interested in or whatever. Oh, they yeah. have, like, PowerPoint nights. That would be mine. It would be <laughs> like Nancy Drew's hair color throughout time. And conclusion, she dyes her hair. <laughs> yes. It can be the only only solution to this Mm -hmm. (laughs) if i just flip through this one i have bad news ned's in this one oh no should we pick a different one no i'm kidding Uh, our patrons (laughs) Patrons why did they do this to us (laughs) 
Well, listen, it's no, probably we're not about pick it, time. It's probably about time. We've had a good Ned break. Yes, that's true. It's time to see. And maybe, you know, maybe she'll break up with him or they'll get close to breaking up. You never know. Probably not. I'll I don't think they the actually ever break one. up in the mystery stories, but. Not that I know they of. They're not really ever together, though, in the mystery true. stories. Like, they're not going steady. That's never. Well, maybe later. It would be much later, yeah. Much, much later. But so if, like, they're just dating, mm-hmm. you never know. She could like somebody else. Ned could just be there. It's probably not. It's probably <laughs> going to be a Ned fest. That's okay. Oh, we'll, we'll see. We'll find out. We'll find out. And so will you uh, <laughs> next time. <laughs> Regular Nancy Drew. Yes. We'll so see. join us then. <laughs> we'll see ya. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Regular Nancy Drew. Email us at regularnancydrew at gmail.com. If you like this episode, make sure to rate, review, and subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram at regularnancydrew and Twitter at regularnd. You can also support us on Patreon. Patrons at the $3 level vote on upcoming episode topics and get exclusive access to our Scoop Sesh series. And all patrons receive early access to each episode as well as weekly bonus content. And to all you regular Drews out there... Thanks for listening. listening.